Yes, Ms. Orr. We turn, Commissioner, to a case study about Bank West. And uh, I'm sorry, we're in the case study about Bank West. Mr. Ruddy was our first witness in that case study. We turn now to the second witness in that case study, Ms. Sinead Taylor. Yes. Yes, Mr. Sherry. Now, Ms. Taylor, would you prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? Affirmation, please. Yes, affirm the witness, please. Yes. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Ms. Taylor. Yes, Mr. Sherry. Ms. Taylor, is your full name Sinead Taylor? Yes, it is. And is your business address 300 Murray Street, Perth? That's right, yes. And are you the Executive General Manager, Personal and Business Banking of Bankwest? Yes, I am. Have you received a summons to attend this Royal Commission? I have. Do you have that with you? I do, yeah. You tender that, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.91, the summons to Ms Taylor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and Ms Taylor, have you made a statement on the 24th of June, which I think it was last Sunday, with an ID number CBA.9000.0070 0001? Yes, I have. And is that a statement of 38 pages? Yes, it is. And is that your signature on the, the last page? Yes, it is. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. We tender that, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.92, the statement of Ms Taylor, 24 June 18. Thank you, Ms Taylor. And Ms Orr will ask you some questions now. Yes, Ms Orr. Ms Taylor, we've heard that you're the Executive General Manager of Personal and Business Banking at Bankwest. Yes, that's right. Uh, Bank West is a division of CBA. Yes, it is. And you've been in your position for about a year since July last year? That's right, yes. And you've been put forward by Bank West to answer questions about its agribusiness operations generally and about Bank West dealings with Mr and Mrs Ruddy? That's right, yes. Were you present for the evidence given by Mr Ruddy before lunch? I was, yes. Thank you. Now, uh, Taylor, I'm sorry, you may have to keep your voice up rather more. I think uh, you have a naturally soft voice, so you may need to be bellowing. Okay. You heard from Mr Ruddy that a number of the issues that he and Mrs Ruddy experienced came to a head in about 2013. Yes. And that was a year in which the number of agricultural customers at Bank West who were experiencing difficulties with servicing their loans spiked, wasn't it? It was, yes. Um, we see from your statement uh, at paragraph 28 uh, CBA 9000000009 and if we could have that page and the subsequent page on the screen at the same time we see from the table within your paragraph 28 uh, that in 2013 there was a noticeable increase in the percentage of Bankwest agricultural clients who entered monetary and non-monetary default. Yes. If we look at first at monetary defaults, the percentage of Bankwest clients who had one or more facilities in monetary default from 2009 to 2012 sat at around 2 to 2.5 per cent. Yes. And in 2013, this jumped to 6.54 per cent. Yes, that's right. And then the percentages began to taper off again. Yes, they did. And if we look at the figures for non-monetary defaults, we see a similar trend. That's right, yes. The percentage of clients in non-monetary default was between 0.5 and 1 per cent from 2010 to 2012. Yes. And in 2013, it jumped to 1.8%. Yes, it did. 
and after 2013 the figures returned to their previous levels, although they appear to have arisen, to, to have risen again last year. Yes, that's right. Now, what do you put the spike in monetary and non-monetary defaults by agricultural customers of Bank West in 2013 down to? So in 2013, uh, there were a number of influences. I believe that if you look uh, at WA to start with, given that was uh, a high proportion of our customer base, there were um, serious droughts on the eastern wheat belt. And um, there had also been issues with agricultural uh, customers throughout Australia from the perspective of external environmental events such as drought, floods and livestock uh, issues. And we see from paragraph 25 of your statement, which is on the previous page, triple zero, I'm sorry, triple uh, zero eight. And if we could have triple zero eight and triple zero nine on the screen at the same time, we see there that there was also a significant spike in customers transferred to Bank West Group Credit Structuring Arm, or GCS, around yes. that same time. That's right. So GCS, you tell us in your statement, is the specialist division of CBA and Bank West that's responsible for the management of customer loans that have been classified as troublesome or impaired assets. That's right. Now, the numbers of agricultural customers transferred to GCS were reasonably low in 2009 and 2010. Yes. And they started growing in 2011 and 2012. Yes. And between 2012 and 2013, there was a jump from 67 a year to 97 a year. That's right, yes. So 2013 again was the high watermark before the numbers began to taper off. That's right. And that trend makes sense because the number of customers transferred to GCS is likely to be linked to the number of customers in monetary and non-monetary default. Is that right? It is right, though they might not correlate exactly. Just because you're in monetary or non-monetary default doesn't mean that you'll necessarily be transferred automatically to GCS. And are there any other factors that you would point to to explain that spike in 2013? So uh, the, the transfer sorry. across? Yes, yeah, so I think um, the other element would be the, uh, the tightening of credit standards at Bank West over that time. Post the acquisition of CBA, there, was, uh, there were changes to policy and process that would have impacted um, over time uh, the, the transfer around about that 2013 mark. Mm -hmm. Then if we look at the table that you've given us at paragraph 36 of your statement, that's CBA 9000070012. Yes. We see there's also an increase in enforcement action um, by Bank West around that time, 2013. There is, yes. So before 2013 and since 2016, Bank West has not taken enforcement action against any more than four agricultural customers in one year. That's right. But in 2013, 14 and 15, the numbers were six, nine and six. That's right, yes. And what do you put the spike in enforcement action in those years down to? It's like, uh, I just to clarify, I don't actually work in uh, GCS, so this is my view from reviewing the file. Um, I would assume that given the increase in numbers of customers transferring through to GCS, um, that over time there would be the requirement to, um, to, you know, if things were not able to be worked out, to take that action. It's obviously not the bank's preference to um, enforcement is the last resort, but that's what I would um, assume would be the driver, recognising that it is under a percent of our agricultural customer base. I'm sorry, I just missed the last bit, recognising that it is... Less than 1% of our agricultural customer base. Thank you. Uh, now, at paragraph 33 of your statement, we have another table, at 0011, which shows us the number of complaints made by Bankwest's agricultural clients to the Financial Ombudsman Service. Yes. And those complaint numbers also increased around the same time? They did, yes. So in 2014, we see the number of complaints from agricultural customers was nine. 
uh, as opposed to five in 2013 and two in 2015? Yes. And more of the complaints lodged in 2014 proceeded to recommendation or determination than complaints lodged in any previous year or in any year since? Yes. And of the three recommendations or determinations that you identify as having been made wholly or partly in the customer's favour as against Bank West since 2008, one related to a complaint originated in 2013 and two to complaints from 2014? Yes. Can you explain why that would be the case? I, can't, I don't have a specific explanation for that. I would assume, again, if you have more customers that are um, through, you know, going to GCS, possibility of enforcement, that there will be an increase, subsequent increase in complaints. Have you looked at the FOS recommendations or determinations that you've set out, the three of them, in paragraph 32 of your statement yes. there, Ms Taylor? You're familiar with those? Yes. Okay. Now, at around the time of these spikes, uh, Bankwest made a decision to centrally service rural business customers outside Western Australia uh, and close the majority of its rural business centres. Yes, Is that right? Did. Yes. Um, and why did Bankwest choose to do that? So the uh, expansion into the East Coast agricultural market took place um, primarily under HBOS and um, over time post acquisition. The view was that whilst uh, Bankwest had expertise in agriculture in WA, having a 120 year history there, that um, the agricultural market and the more rural and regional markets in, East, in the East Coast were well served and better served uh, by, by other banks that had more local knowledge and presence. And as a result, the decision was taken to gradually move out of those um, locations. I should clarify, um, it probably doesn't read the way it's intended. Uh, we didn't have a goal to centrally manage customers, uh, East Coast agricultural customers um, through WA because that wouldn't be practical. Um, we have a small number of customers who have either not been able to refinance or have chosen to stay with Bank West. There are 35 of them that are managed out of WA. I see. And did the decision to centrally service the East Coast agricultural customers contribute to any of the matters that we've just discussed? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I don't believe they would have. They were still, this, uh, each customer would have still had a relationship point of contact. They were still being managed, and I don't believe it would have impacted on those numbers, no. I see. All right. Now, I want to turn to Bankwest's dealings with Mr and Mrs Ruddy. The Ruddies became uh, customers of Bank West in October 2011. Yes, that's right. Uh, and Mr and Mrs Ruddy, as you've heard from Mr Ruddy, moved across from Rural Bank? Yes, he did. And Bank West knew that the Ruddies were valued customers of Rural Bank? So I have seen that in the file, yes. Yes. And Bank West therefore considered that it needed to price its offer to the Ruddies accordingly? So I think, uh, from my recollection of the review of the file, the reference to pricing related to uh, the competitive nature of rural, that they would counter an offer, and therefore, yes, we, we did put forward a, an aggressive price. An aggressive price. All right, so could we look at uh, one of your exhibits? It's Exhibit 84 to your statement. CBA 0010374021. So this is a credit risk submission put together by uh, the bank manager, the first bank manager, who is the subject of a non-publication direction uh, that Mr and Mrs Ruddy had at Bank West prior to their move to Bank West in October 2011. Yes. So we see it's August 2011 that this document was produced. That's right, yes. <coughs> Uh, could we have that taken off the screen, please? Um, 
You have a copy of that document do, in yes. front of you. There was a name that ought to have been redacted in the document and was not. So I apologise, but I'll, um, at least while I'm dealing with that page of the document, um, not have the document on the screen. Uh, now, uh, as I'd said to you, this was a credit submission prepared in uh, August ahead of the Ruddy's move across to Bank West in October of 2011. Yes, it is. And if we, do you know if the next page is all right? If we turn to the next page, which one's redacted, so I don't know. Okay, uh, we'll turn to the next page, which is zero two one four, which should be able to be brought on the screen because there's no reference to the name of the bank manager in that page. Now. Um, Prior to the loan facilities being entered into, we see that the bank manager, under the heading pricing approval, puts in this document, pricing is within the head of rural and regional approval level and has been submitted for approval. A competitive pricing margin has been implemented due to the competition from existing bank. Submitting manager is aware that the applicant's current banker, Mark Payne, will be willing to aggressively adjusted margins to retain the connection. Yes. So that supports what you were saying about the aggressive nature of the pricing that Bank West came up with for the Ruddy's business? Yes. Uh, and you'll see on the previous page, but we won't bring it up on the screen, that Bank West was aware that the Ruddies had three separate facilities with Rural Bank, uh, which totaled $1.02 million. Yes, that's right. A $425,000 facility, a $100,000 facility, a $170,000 facility, and a $325,000 facility. Yes, that's right. And the decision for which the bank manager sought approval in this document was to refinance those facilities and provide an additional $100,000 of credit for the purchase of livestock. That's right, yes. Now, at the time of this document, Bankwest contemplated that there would be two types of security taken. Yes. And one was Aaron Field. That's right. And this document lists it as having a registered market value of $1.1 million. Yes. And the other was Sunrise, which was listed as having a registered market value of $1.2 million. That's right, yes. Now, if we turn to 0217, we'll see that based on those values of the two properties, which are listed in the table in the middle there, Bankwest estimated the LVR, or the loan to value ratio, at 48.7%. Do you see that under the descriptions of the properties on the left-hand uh, column? Yes, I do. Uh, now, this was considered, we see in this document, by Bankwest to be a low LVR. Yes. Uh, and if we turn to 0220, We see the reference there under strengths, security position, low LVR. So that was considered to be a strength of the loan. It's a, it's a contributing consideration in the loan. Well, we see there strengths and weaknesses under the heading SWOT analysis. What's the SWOT analysis? So that is, yes, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Thank you. Uh, now. There are a number of other strengths of the loan listed there, including the Ruddy's sound planning skills. Yes. Uh, now, the submission at a number of points refers to Mr Ruddy's lifetime experience in the cattle industry. Yes, it does. And in Bank West's assessment of the weaknesses of and threats to the loan on this page, we see that Bank West focus principally upon factors outside the Ruddy's control. So drought conditions returning, a decline in the red meat market, and any illness or sickness to Mr Ruddy. That's right, yes. So as we've heard from Mr Ruddy, the bank manager who wrote this credit submission in August 2011 was instrumental in bringing the Ruddy's across to Bank West from Rural Bank. As far as I can tell from this, yes. Yes. 
uh, and you heard Mr Ruddy's evidence um, about if this had not happened, if the bank manager hadn't turned up offering this business, he says he would have sold Sunrise and not increased his debt position. He did, yes. Now, Mr and Mrs Ruddy weren't the only customers that this particular bank manager brought across from Rural Bank to Bank West, were they? No, that's right. Uh, the bank manager had previously worked at Rural Bank? Yes. And how many customers did he bring across from Rural Bank to Bank West? I don't know that exact number, I'm sorry. Are you able to give an estimate? Uh, five or six. Mm -hmm. Now, what were the bank manager's KPIs at the time that he moved the Ruddies across to Bank West? Uh, the bank manager's KPIs related to, he had financial KPIs, risk KPIs, uh, there was a customer satisfaction KPI um, and a productivity KPI. What were the financial KPIs? The financial, a, a breakdown of each one or just the weighting? Uh, both, thank okay. you. So uh, asset growth um, was one of the financial KPIs and I believe revenue growth was the other. Now, uh, I'll show you a document uh, about these KPIs. It's CBA 0001. 03962483 Now un unfortunately this is quite difficult to read. I don't know if you've I assume you've looked at this document I before have, giving yes. your evidence and we'll do our best um, uh, to no, make no. it clear to others. Y yes, yes. Do you have one we could provide the commissioner? Your council would like to provide you with okay. a hard copy to assist, and I've suggested it might also assist the commissioner to receive one as well. Thank you. So this shows the KPIs for financial year 2012, which was the year that the Ruddies moved across to Bankwest. Yes, that's and right. And it's the KPIs for senior relationship managers, such as the bank manager in question. I believe it actually is for all of the roles at the bottom of the page, um, but the senior relationship manager is listed, yes. Yes, yes. Now, the KPIs for senior relationship managers were heavily weighted towards profitable growth, weren't they? They were, yes. Now, profitable growth is the first five columns. Do we see that? You see, and if we can expand it on the screen, we see the heading profitable growth right at the top of the page and then five columns underneath that. Yes, that's on right. On the left hand side at the top. Uh, now, the KPIs appear to be divided into the following categories. Profitable growth, managing risk, customer and people. Is that right? Yes, that is right. And 20% of the KPIs were associated with managing risk? Yes. And 10% were associated with people? Yes, that's right. Does that category refer to uh, internal interactions with Bankwest staff? Yes, I believe um, it related to uh, people engagement and teamwork, yes. And 10% were associated with customer satisfaction. Yes, that's right. Now, if it assists uh, the Commissioner in particular with his hard copy of the document, we see those percentages at the bottom of the page. We see the um, types of KPIs listed at the top of the page and the figures at the bottom of the page. So 20% for managing risk, 10% for people, 10% for customer satisfaction, and the remaining 60% were associated with subcategories of profitable growth. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so there are five categories within profitable growth. Yes. And the most significant subcategory under profitable growth was asset sales targets. Yes, that's right. And that 
KPI contributed 30% of the bank manager's KPIs for the 2012 financial year. Yes, it did, yes. So nearly a third of yes. the KPIs. So Bankwest principally judged the performance of employees like this bank manager by reference to whether they were making sales. So they did in terms of the weightings of the KPIs, but I do understand that the risk metric, the 20% 20, 20 risk metric, um, there was a requirement to meet your risk metric as well. So that's the managing risk KPI, is yes, that what you're referring right. to? Yes. So you had to meet that, but otherwise your performance was judged principally by reference to making sales? Yes. Uh, and these were important to whether or not uh, the bank manager received a bonus or what was referred to within Bankwest as a short-term incentive opportunity. So they would have, and again, um, I wasn't there to be as familiar with this, but my understanding is that um, across all of those measures, you were required to to meet in each ind individual discrete area, so customer satisfaction as well as your people and the risk, um, and the uh, as well as financial. So you couldn't just meet your financial targets and receive an SDI. But you needed to meet your financial targets to be eligible for the bonus, didn't you? No, you didn't. You didn't? There was no financial gate opener. Okay. So were any of these gate openers? Uh, risk was the gate opener. Risk was the gate opener. So you needed to satisfy that one. And then how did the other KPIs interrelate with the bonus? So what happens is um, from the perspective of, as an example, financial, you'd look, we'd look across each of the individual metrics. Someone would be rated against how they performed um, against each of those. It's uh, a weighted at scorecard. So you would, um, assuming that someone had performed reasonably well across all of their measures, uh, they would have been then, and met their risk measures, they would have been eligible to be um, to, for an incentive. How that actually works in practice is you are set a potential uh, for your STI. If you were a meets expectation, which I believe this banker was, that would mean you had done okay across all of your metrics and had, um, you know, it wouldn't have been that you'd um, exceeded all of them. And you would then get roughly thir between 30 and 50% of that potential. Of the bonus, of the potential bonus. Of the potential. So the potential is a figure. What, you, um, what you're what you eligible to receive depends on how you perform across all of those KPIs. Yes, I see. And the KPIs, which we've seen, are about a third rated towards your sales. But just because you don't meet the sales or financial objectives doesn't mean that you're not eligible for an STI. I understand. Now, what are the current KPIs for... Um, bank managers dealing with agricultural customers? So the current KPIs uh, financial is 40%. Um, there is a, the risk is not a KPI, it's actually a, called a risk objective and it is a, um, it is a gate opener, so you can't, um, you're not eligible for any performance incentive if you don't meet your risk objective, which is very um, specific. Uh, and you also have to meet your behavioural um, objectives as well. So we have a set of behaviours that we um, expect people to operate within. Uh, so we have financial at 40, we have productivity, um, and we also have customer, and we do have the, the people, which is the people and culture teamwork. So is the financial KPI still the largest of any of the KPIs? It is the largest, yes. Worth noting that the potentials, um, the potential STI now is um, much lower than it was at the at the time um, that we're talking about in 2012. So the amount of the bonus has decreased. The amount of the potential yes. has decreased, and therefore the bonus must. Yes. Yes, I see. Um, so 40% of the KPIs are towards um, financial matters, uh, including. Uh, asset sales targets such as we have here? That's a 10% measure. And what are the other subcategories within the financial metrics? Uh, so there's a revenue uh, measure and uh, there is a profitability measure, so PAC. 
And what's the weighting for each of those, Ms Taylor? Uh, it is 20 for revenue and 10 for the other. 10 for profitability. Yes. And what does profitability measure? Uh, profit after capital charge. And revenue? Uh, revenue is the revenue of the actual portfolio. And the asset sales targets? Is the uh, proportion of loans that would be written on the, on the uh, portfolio. Now you said, uh, I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Rural and regional banking KPIs as at, or oh, for financial year 2012, CBA treble zero one zero three nine six two four eight three will be exhibit four point nine three. Now with the particular bank manager who dealt with the Ruddies, you said before that he had done okay, he had been ranked meets expectations. Yes, yeah. And and where does that sit in the spectrum? So in the spectrum, um, which is actually listed on the, the left hand side, you have exceeds, you have meets and sometimes exceeds. You have meets and then you have does not meet. So did that put him somewhere in the middle? Is that very much the middle? Yes. The middle. Okay. Uh, could I ask you to look at a document which is CBA triple zero one zero three nine three zero zero eight two? Have you seen this document before, Ms. Taylor? Yes, I have. So this document relates to business CEO awards given by Bank West for rural and regional champions on the 18th of August 2011. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Now, if we could turn within that document to 0083. Now, the names of all of the rural and regional uh, champions have been redacted, but you can see, can you not, Ms Taylor, that the second last entry on the page next to Toowoomba, Queensland, relates to the bank manager? Yes, that's right. So for the 2010 to 2011 year, the bank manager was named a rural and regional champion? Yes, that's right. And Bankwest, we see there, recognised his achievements because he had achieved 134% of his sales target in the 2011 financial year. Yes, that's right. His target was $25 million in sales and he had achieved sales of $33.5 million. Yes, that's right. And he did this, the document tells us, by processing in excess of 60 applications most of which were new to bank clients. That's right, yes. So do you still say, Ms Taylor, that he was doing okay? Yes, because, well, if you base it on his actual performance rating and the resultant STI that would be paid, he was a meets expectations, therefore, the, despite the fact that he had had, obviously, very strong sales results, this would have been tempered by his performance across other areas. I see. So his sales results were strong enough that he was named one of a small number of rural, rural and regional champions by the CEO that year? Uh, just to clarify as well, so the, um, the CEO was the head of the business bank, so it was just a title of the business bank. It wasn't the overall I see. West. It was uh, specific to the rural and regional team. Yes, I it see. It was their, their awards. I see, but still a significant achievement, 134% of his sales target. Mm -hmm. Yes, depending on what his sales target was. Well, we see what his sales target was. It was 25 million. Yes. And he exceeded that by getting to 33.5 million. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Rural and Regional Champions, August 2011, CBA 0010393 0082, Exhibit 4.94. 
What was the prize for being a rural and regional banking champion, Ms Taylor? I understand they went on a trip to Heman Island. I see. All right. And was I... there an equivalent uh, uh, award made for someone who uh, exceeded expectations on the whole scorecard? Uh, the, this was the only set of awards that I'm aware of at that time. The only overt uh, recognition given by the bank uh, was for selling. At that point it was, yes. Yes. No longer is. Now, uh, could I ask you to look at another spreadsheet, uh, which is CBA 0001039407500. I don't think it will be necessary for the Commissioner to have a copy of this document. The, the documents from now on should be legible enough to read on the screen. Thank you. Just waiting for that document to come up. CBA 0001039407500. I'm not sure how it will work on your hard copy, Ms Taylor, but what I'm going to ask you about is under tab 2011 of the spreadsheet, and it's row 17, right. which I think will be relatively straightforward to bring up on the screen. I hope will be straightforward to bring up on the screen, but I'm not sure exactly how you're going here. to do that on yours. I've got it. Perhaps if I could ask you some questions, sure. because you can see the document, um, and it may not be necessary to bring it up on the screen. Can we see from that spreadsheet that the bank manager's base remuneration was about $128,000? We're in row 17 in tab 2011. Yes. Approximately $128,000? Yes, that's right. And in 2010, his short-term incentive plan payments were $15,000? Yes. And in 2011, his short-term incentive plan payments were $35,000. That's right, yes. And then we have a column, which is column Z, which is described potential as percentage of base. That's... Yes. Do you see that? Can you explain what that column is? So that's what I referred to earlier, which is the, um, the STI potential is a percentage of your base salary before super. Yes, I see. Uh, so does that mean that the potential for this bank manager was 57% of his base salary? Yes, that's what that means. That was the maximum bonus he could obtain? Yes, that's right. So he received his base salary and up to 57% additional as a bonus? Yes, that's right. Now, uh, is in the entry that's directly above the bank manager's entry, so that's row 16, column Z, we see that the employee's short-term incentive payment totaled more than 100 does look like that, yes. And I, I want to suggest to you that we see that for a number of employees at a number of places in this spreadsheet. And I, 
want to understand whether it was the position that Bank West employees could double their base income through their bonus payments. I'm not aware of that having been the case, but obviously there are instances on the spreadsheet. There are instances on the spreadsheet? It would appear there are, yes. Yes, so it was the case. I'm not sure that there was a policy, but there may have been, an, or there are a number of instances where that's happened. Yes. So it, Bank West employees could double their base income through their bonus payments? They could, yes. Thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. What do I call it as well? Well, it's a spreadsheet um, recording uh, remuneration packages of bank managers for 2011. Spreadsheet uh, remuneration packages, Bankwest, uh, bank managers, 2011, CBA 0001039407500, exhibit 4.95. Could I ask you to look at CBA 0517-0085-0010? So that was 2011 we were looking at, where you've agreed that it was possible for people to double their base salary with their bonus payment. Now, this document relates to 2012, March 2012. It's a commercial business and private bank FY12 KPIs and incentive scheme overview. Yes, it is. So we see that shortly after the period we were looking at in the previous document, in the 2012 financial year, on page 0011, Bankwest had concerns about whether its incentive scheme was a sufficiently strong motivator to stretch performance. Do you see that in the third bullet point down? Well, that, that was the feedback. So just to clarify, this is not a documented KPI pack. This, from what I can gather, is a pack that was tabled off the back of colleague feedback mm -hmm. to the leadership team of the time. Mm -hmm. So who are the colleagues? The, the, the bankers, bank managers. The bankers. So yes. the bank managers are telling the bank that the current scheme is not a motivator to stretch performance. They need a scheme that dangles the carrot and rewards top performers. They wanted more reward. That would be appear to be what it says, yes. All right. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, commercial uh, business and private bank FY12 KPIs and incentive scheme overview CBA 0517008500010 exhibit 4.96. Now the bank manager left Bank West on the 28th of March 2012. You tell us that in your statement? Yes, that's right. And you tell us in your statement that he was ineligible for any remuneration or incentive payment for the 2012 financial year in respect of the loans made to the Ruddies? Yes, that's right. Why was that? Uh, if you leave the bank, you're not eligible for an STI payment. Okay. Now, why did the bank manager leave Bank West? Uh, the bank manager resigned from Bank West. What were the circumstances of his resignation? Um, I have found out in uh, post uh, providing my statement through uh, reviewing the ready file and some of the submissions that there were some issues or beliefs of issues with conduct. Some issues, what did you say Ms Taylor? Conduct issues. Conduct issues. What sort of conduct issues were there? Uh, so from the review I've been able to do, there was um, an issue, there was an issue with valuations issue with uh, some discrepancies in some of the transactions that he'd undertaken and there was an issue with a uh, transfer of a payment. Now, could I ask you just to deal with each of those in turn? What were the issues in relation to this bank manager in connection with valuations? So there was a concern that he had overstated valuations. That he had overstated valuations? Yes. What was the concern with the discrepancies in transactions? That was a concern around uh, the accuracy of the inputs into his applications. 
What does that mean, Ms. Taylor? It means there were some discrepancies between uh, the numbers uh, that uh, were on some of the financial statements and what he had input into the system. Right, so inconsistencies between the customer information and what he had entered yes. into Bank West about the customer? Yes. Okay. Um, in the customer's favour? Uh, well, it's relating to financial information, so... I see. And what was the issue with transfer of payment? Uh, there was, I believe, a payment issue where he had uh, the banker had misrepresented. Um, he had uh, re represented that he was putting money into a term deposit and it was moved into another customer's account. So he misrepresented that he was putting one customer's money into their term deposit, yes. but instead he moved it into another customer's account? Yes, that's right. A customer unrelated to the first customer? As far as I can tell, yes. So these issues were identified in the lead up to and following his departure from the bank? Uh, around about exactly the time of his departure from the bank. And did Bankwest identify that the bank manager had also engaged in inappropriate and improper mis-selling? Uh, they did reference that in a document, yes. And what did that relate to? So. Uh, I have only seen some of the documents relating to this issue. Um, I can't ascertain from that sentence specifically what they're referring to. And the bank manager had also issued two unconditional letters of credit approval to two customers? Yes, he had. In circumstances where he should not have? That's right, yes. And he'd given the inappropriate um, advice to a customer about payment of the term deposit that you referred to before? Yes, that's the one. And that involved an apparent promise of a particular interest rate, but then he directed the funds to the other account that's of right. the other customer? Yes. Uh, and the bank manager was also found to have been um, manipulating internal bankware systems to avoid behavioural triggers in the system? Yes, that's right. Uh, and he had misled junior staff to affect particular transactions? Yes. Uh, and as you said, he had inflated valuations to meet credit requirements? Yes. So he left in March 2012, and by early May 2012, there were at least 15 separate customer complaints about the bank manager? That's right, yes. Uh, and he was identified as having been involved in three major risk incidents. Uh, um, I don't recall that from the file. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the, uh, if you're referencing the three that went into Risk Insight, yes, yes they relate to what we, we uh, were talking about earlier. Yes. Th those are the same yes, events? Yes, they're the same. Yeah, the same three. And those events had resulted in a loss by that point, uh, by early May 2012, of $374,000. A loss to the bank, yes. 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 And the bank manager's conduct uh, led to a review, it led to two reviews. One review of the operational processes within Bank West's Rural and Regional Division, which was conducted by representatives of the fraud and investigations team, the legal team, the operational risk team, the business credit team, and rural and regional mm -hmm. management. That's right, yes. Uh, and it also led to a credit review of the Toowoomba-based loan portfolio. Yes. And that was to be completed by the end of May? That's right, yes. Now, that review would have captured the Ruddy's loan, wouldn't it? It would, yes. And how did Bank West uh, work its way through the to Toowoomba loan portfolio in that review? So, from my understanding, uh, they uh, basically categorised the size of the loans and yep. worked through in that from the, the biggest, largest loan um, and worked from there. And where did the Ruddy's loan sit in that spectrum of biggest to smallest? They would have been at the smaller end, yes. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the bank manager had been issuing inflated valuations was known to Bank West by early April 2012. Yes. Uh, now, by mid-April 2012, Bank West was concerned about any deal that had been done on which the bank manager was the sole valuer. That's right, yes. 
and Bank West estimated at that time that there were five valuations on which he had been the sole valuer. That's right, yes. And they would have included the Ruddies, is that right? Yes, from my understanding. Then on the 16th of May 2012, um, the Toowoomba Review was raised at a Bank West Executive Committee meeting. Yes. And there was a suggestion uh, to the Executive Committee uh, that there needed to be a discussion about cultural aspects and the role that cultural aspects had played in these incidents. That's right, yes. Uh, and there was a suggestion that an independent review on culture could be undertaken. That's right. Did that review of culture occur? So I haven't yet been able to locate the evidence of that review of culture. However, Bank West did, um, did start a major risk culture program late 2013. Late 2013. 13. So we're in May 2012 when the Executive <coughs> Committee is talking about these matters yes. and saying that a review of culture should occur. Yes. Um, you say there was a review uh, in 2013. So I do not know that there was not a review uh, at that time. I haven't been able to locate any documentation Yes, and the Commission served a notice to produce on Bank yes. West that's returned no documents about that review. Yes, two days ago, yes. Yes. Uh, so are you able to say whether it happened or not? I'm not able to say whether it happened or not. But you found no evidence of it? That's right. Okay. Now, after the bank manager left Bank West, did Bank West contact the Ruddies to tell them about that? Bank West contacted all of the customers of the banker. Mm -hmm. And what were the customers told about the circumstances of the bank manager's departure from the bank? I believe they were told that he had resigned and that uh, they were provided with the details of their new bank manager and there was also a discussion about um, how they had found the service um, and that was the extent of those calls. But they weren't told that the bank had worked out by this time that he was inflating valuations, were they? The customers uh, that had been involved in um, the major incidents had been told, the three that you referred to, um, the others were not, no. No. The three major incidents weren't the valuations being no, inflated, right. were they? No. Uh, there was, uh, we believe, the five valuations. We've only been able to locate three. So of the five valuations that you identified where the bank manager was the sole valuer, did you tell any of the customers? Uh, that the bank manager had been found by Bank West to have inflated valuations? No, I can't find any record of that. It didn't happen? I have no record. I have no record of what the actual discussions were. Yes. You heard Mr Ruddy's evidence about his recollection of that discussion? Yes, I did. That he asked why the bank manager um, had ceased to be the bank manager? Yes, I did. And he was told no more than he'd departed, he was moving on? Yes. Would it have assisted Mr Ruddy to understand at that time that there was a risk that his valuation had been inflated by the bank manager? Yes, all of the customers should have been told that there was an issue. Yes, and they were not? No, they were not. Was that fair to the customers, Ms Taylor? No. And you accept that that was a breach of Clause 2.2 of the Banking Code of Practice and the obligation therein to act fairly and reasonably towards customers? Yes, I do. Thank you. Now, uh, did Bank West take any disciplinary action against the bank manager before he resigned? Not that I am aware of. Did it take any action at all against the bank manager? So uh, I can see in the file there was an investigation. I can't see any evidence of any action against the banker. I see. All right. Now, I want to return to the move by Mr and Mrs Ruddy across to Bank West from Rural Bank and the offer of those three loan facilities to the Ruddies at that time. Uh, those loan facilities were accepted by the Ruddies in October 2011 and they were guaranteed by one of the Ruddies' sons. Yes. Uh, you, you will have heard earlier that his name is the subject of a yes. non-publication order. Now, uh, Mr and Mrs Ruddy's son executed the guarantees that were contained in the letters of offer on the same day that the letters of offer were issued, on the 21st of September 2011. Yes.
that Mr and Mrs Ruddy didn't execute the letters of offer until the 17th of October 2011. That's right. So their son executed his guarantees about a month before either of the letters of offer were executed. That's right. Was that standard Bank West practice? I'm not aware of it being standard Bank West practice. Was that an appropriate way of doing this? I, I don't have any visibility at the time of, of um, I do understand that the son did work um, on rigs and therefore may not have been available to, um, to sign at the relevant time, but as I say, I have no information. Well, as well as the guarantees that he signed that were in the letters of offer, um, Bank West also asked him to execute separate guarantees and indemnities, which you've annexed to your statement. Yes. Now, he executed those as well? Yes. And none of those is dated? That's right. And neither is the guarantee that you obtained from Mrs Ruddy? That's right. So again, was that standard Bank West practice to obtain undated guarantees? No, that wouldn't be standard practice. Was that acceptable? It was accepted in this instance, I wouldn't... Well, I do you accept that? No, I don't accept that, no. Now, within the letters of offer, we see that um, Mr and Mrs Ruddy were required to give an undertaking that they would maintain an LVR of less than or equal to 50%. Yes. And that requirement applied to each of the facilities? That's right. And the LVR figure changed a bit over time, we see from the documents. Yes, it did. In September 2012, it was increased to 55%. That's right. And in June 2013, which we'll come to, it was removed, the LVR condition. That's right, yes. Now, it was a condition precedent of the loans that valuation reports be obtained in respect of the two security properties, Aaronfield and Sunrise. Yes. And in respect of Aaronfield, it was a condition precedent that a valuation report be obtained from one of Bank West's approved panel valuers at the ruddy expense, confirming a minimum current market valuation of $1.1 million. Yes. And for Sunrise, it was a condition precedent that a valuation report be obtained from one of Bank West's approved panel valuers at the ruddy's expense confirming a $1.2 million value. Yes. So that was a condition precedent of each of the facilities. Yes. And did Bank West waive that condition precedent? Well, in internal valuations were done. So did they waive that condition precedent? So the bank manager did the valuations and he wasn't an approved panel valuer, was he? No, he was an accredited valuer for Bank West. So he was permitted by your policies to value properties? He was. Uh, he carried out the two-day accreditation and he was permitted by policy to uh, therefore value properties up to $5 million. So in what circumstances were bank managers permitted to conduct valuations on properties that would secure a loan that they themselves were writing? That, that would be normal circumstance. That was the normal circumstance? not to use an independent or external valuer? So there is the choice to use the independent or external valuer. Um, a lot of customers uh, would prefer not to pay and therefore the internally badge, particularly for rural valuations, is, is a standard policy. That was the norm? It wasn't the norm. We've done 24 internal valuations in the last three years, so it wasn't the norm, but anyone who was badged was able to carry out those valuations. Okay, so permitted to do so. Permitted to do so. And yes. he had done so and he did so in this instance? Yes, he did. Thank you. Uh, now, there was no need for that valuation to be jointly signed off by anyone else? So the valuation goes with the credit application to credit and the credit officer is required to validate the valuation um, prior to approving the deal. And under your policy at that time, uh, where the exposure was less than $2 million, there was no requirement for the internal valuer to complete a site inspection, was there? Uh, no, I don't believe there was. Mm -hmm. Why not? Uh, that was the policy. I'm sorry, I'm not sure of what the reason would be. As a matter of general policy, um, the, the 
policies that we have from Bank West for valuations at these times show that there was a maximum safe lending margin of 60% for properties that were valued uh, by internal valuers. Yes. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. So why was that there? Uh, the safe lending margin applies to all valuations, but the safe lending margin is basically uh, the measure of um, the proportion of a valuation that you'd be willing to lend against. So we take historical loss data and apply that to the 100% value. And uh, from a historical perspective of these types of deals, we generally would lose 40% um, if that deal uh, ended up in GCS and there were issues with the transaction, our loss would be 40%. Therefore, the safe lending margin is 60%. So is the safe lending margin different for an internal valuation or not? No. No, it's the same? Yes. I see. Now, when were the valuations of the Ruddy's properties done? Uh, from recollection, they were done in the September. Uh, it appears that they were done on the 21st and 25th of October 2011. If it assists you, you deal with this in paragraphs 115 and 116 of your statement. Is that right, yes, Ms Taylor? Yes. yes. So they were done after the letters of offer were signed by Mr and Mrs Ruddy on the 17th of October 2011. The dates would indicate that, yes. Yes. After they signed the letters of offer? Yes. And the valuation of Aaron Field was 1.1 million? Yes. And if Sunrise was 1.2 million? Yes. But can I just clarify something? The conditioned yes. president means that the documents can be signed um, and the valuation is a condition of funding. So the valuation can actually happen after the documents are signed, the letter of offer is signed. And is funding held up until yes, the until valuation such time is, is the provided? Yes, until valuation is provided. Okay. Now, uh, can I take you to the Sunrise valuation, which you've exhibited as Exhibit 75 to your statement, for So this is a uh, now we'll have to do this without the document on the screen again I'm afraid uh, because it seems your exhibits have not been redacted uh, so I'll ask you to look at the valuation yes. report and when we move to a page where the bank manager's name does not appear I'll have it brought up on the screen, but for now, the first page uh, has the name of the bank manager. Yes. So this is a copy of the valuation report that was prepared for Sunrise, dated the 25th of October 2011. We see that's the date of inspection and valuation. Yes, it is. But if we turn to 2184, which we will not put on the screen, we see it's signed by the bank manager and next to his signature, date of valuation, the 1st of August 2012. Yes. Is that date correct? No, it can't be correct. The bank manager had left Bank West yes. by that time. He left in March 2012. Yes, that's correct. So can you offer any explanation for why this date appears on the valuation? I can't, I'm sorry. You can't? No. There's a similar issue with the valuation report in respect of Aaronfield, isn't there? Ah, uh, yes. It's dated the 19th of October 2012. Yes. Long after the bank manager had left. Yes. Can you offer any explanation for that? No, I can't. All right. Uh, staying with the Sunrise valuation and back to the first page, which we won't place on the screen, the size of the properties listed there is being 72 hectares? Yes, that's right. Now, 
Uh, I'd like you to turn to pages 2181 and 2182, which we can put on the screen. We see there that section 8 of the report deals with comparable sales. Yes. And three comparable properties are listed. One of those is about 263 hectares, one's 360 hectares, uh, and one's 291 hectares. Yes, that's right. And we see that the report states at 2182 that those comparators are considered superior to subject as smaller block with superior improvements. Yes. And then if we turn to 2183 to 2184, I'm hoping at uh, 2183 we can have on the screen, not 2184. CBA 4000096 thank you. Uh, we're in section 10 of the report entitled Property Valuation and we see a total land value of 1.0836 listed there. Yes. And that figure has been reached by adopting a price per hectare and multiplying that figure by the number of hectares. That's right, yes. So all up, the bank managers referred to there being 896 hectares, um, 400 hectares of self-mulching land, 200 of lighter red soils and 296 of grazing country. Yes. So the basis upon which he valued Sunrise is that it was a property comprising 896 hectares. Yes. But Sunrise was 72 hectares in size. That's right, yes. So you accept that the valuation is wrong, Ms Taylor? So I accept that the inputs to the valuation is wrong. I can't determine from the calculations, given that Ironfield was correct, whether the $1.2 million value is incorrect. I know that there's a calculation has been done, but we did check um, at the 2011 annual review to valuers were asked to validate the pricing for Sunrise and they confirmed that the even at 2012, the $1.2 million hadn't moved. So that's the only data point that I have for the actual value of the property. Yes, well, let, let's come to what you learnt later. But at this time, this is the valuation that's relied on in 2011. And a 72 hectare block has been valued on the basis that it's an 896 hectare block. Yes. And you accept that by getting this valuation wrong, Bankwest engaged in conduct that fell below the community's standards and expectations. Yes. This valuation was relied on by Mr Ruddy and his wife in the decision that they made to change their course away from the sale of Sunrise to a strategy of holding Sunrise and borrowing more money. Do you I, accept that? Yes, I do. And it was wrong? It was wrong. Mm -hmm. And Bank West did not tell the Ruddies that it was wrong? No, they did not. And should they have? Yes. Valuations are a method of assessing the customer's ability to service a loan, aren't they, Ms Taylor? No, the valuation does not contribute to servicing. Not at all? No. It relates to the security position. Mm -hmm. And the bank doesn't consider the security position in assessing serviceability? Serviceability is about the ability to uh, meet repayments mm -hmm. and uh, it is the cash flows and the operating performance of the business that contributes to the servicing exercise. I see. All right, so these valuations, which have two dates on them, the October 2011 date and the August and October 2012 date, let, let's assume that they were conducted in October 2011, while the bank manager was still with Bankwest. By mid-April 2012, Bankwest knew of the issues with the five valuations that the bank manager was the sole valuer for. Yes. Uh, and uh, as we've discussed, Bankwest did not at that time advise the Ruddies of those issues. That's right. 
And the way Bankwest uh, dealt with this internally um, is shown in a document that I'll um, have brought up on the screen, CBA 4000094616. So this is an email chain um, from Paul Nielsen, Senior Manager Business Credit, to Belinda King. Uh, who by that time had become the Ruddy's bank manager. Yes, she'd always been on the Ruddy's portfolio, but she became the manager. Yes, she had been assisting on the Ruddy's yes, portfolio before that time. Yes. So this is an email from the 2nd of May 2012 that relates to Mr and Mrs Ruddy's loans. Yes. And at 616, we see under the heading valuations and insurance, uh, there are errors in relation to internal valuations undertaken in conjunction with original approval with the following amendments to apply pending reassessment or confirmation of valuations in conjunction with 31st of August 2012 annual review or an earlier credit event. Yes, that's right. And we see that in respect of Aaronfield, the issue with the date of the valuation was <coughs> noted. Yes and discrepancies in how the insured value was calculated were detected? Yes, that's right. But reading through the final paragraph under that Aaronfield heading, it appears that Bankwest approved continued reliance on a market value of 1.1 million pending reassessment by the 31st of August 2012. Yes, that's right. Uh, and in respect of Sunrise, there was an equivalent issue noted with the date of the valuation. Yes. And again, there were discrepancies in how the insured value was calculated. Yes. And the upshot of those discrepancies we see at 0617 was that the valuation amount of 1.3 million was to be reduced to 1.16 million pending reassessment by the 31st of August 2012. Yes, that's right. And Mr Nielsen goes on to say, group summary reflects market value of 1.2 million with internal valuation date 20 October 2011. Please amend to 1.16 million uh, with date 25 October 2011. That's right, yes. So was it common practice to internally amend a valuation in that way? So they're not amending the valuation, they're actually um, amending the, the value attributed to the property. So the valuation is a separate document. This is uh, an assessment by credit whereby they have realised that the, the actual buildings and property on the land are not insured to the level um, that they're valued at and therefore it has to be reduced. So the valuation as in the valuation document hasn't been changed. No, the valuation that it. we recognise for LVR purposes The has. value in the system has yes, been changed. Yes, that's right, yes. Uh, so having established that there were errors in the valuations completed by the bank manager for both the properties, the response was to wait a number of months, a number of months until the August annual review or an earlier credit event to reassess or confirm the valuations. Yes, the 31st of the 8th would be the annual review for the facility yes. and there is, that's the uh, check that I talked about where the banker will make inquiries as to what the value of the property is. Um, this, these errors, this relates to the credit officers, he's reviewed one particular component of the valuation mm. um, as opposed to picking up. He hasn't worked out the fundamental the problem fundamental by this error. point, has that's he? That's right. No, he hasn't. Hasn't worked out the difference between the number of hectares used in the calculation. But no, he's he worked hasn't. out other errors with the valuations. Yes. Um, and he's decided that the appropriate thing to do is to leave everything as it is until the August 2012 review, despite the fact that by this time there were the significant broader concerns about the bank manager's conduct. Yes, that's right. Was that an appropriate decision? No. What should have happened at this time, Ms Taylor? Well, by this time, the valuation error should have been picked up long before this. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. 
Emails Nilsson to King 2 May 2012, CBA 4000 00940616, Exhibit 4.97. And as things transpired, Bankwest didn't have either of the properties revalued in August 2012, did they? So that, that when they say reassessment, they don't mean that we would be getting the properties revalued. Mm -hmm. That is part of the annual review, which is um, to make inquiries as, uh, as to the value of the property in relation to the values that we currently hold. In the event that there is a belief that there's been a significant move in that security value, then we would instruct valuers. And were those inquiries made in August 2012? They were. The relationship manager called two external valuers um, in relation to both Sunrise and Ironfield and inquired as to whether Sunrise was still worth the 1.2 million. She was told by both that they, um, the values were likely to be the same. That's noted in the annual review. And then there was a revaluation in May 2013. Yes, is that it was. right? Yes. Why was that revaluation done? So, um, over the course of uh, the Ruddy's facility, there had been quite a number of temporary um, increases required. Um, to it'd be useful to give some context, when the funding took place, uh, we had provided that additional $100,000. Um, it transpired that the rural facility was um, had exceeded its limits and therefore that amount had to be settled from the 100,000. So the 100,000 was actually around um, just over 70,000. Um, there were significant challenges in the first few months of the account. Uh, uh, there were floods in, um, in Queensland and I believe that Mr Ruddy from my review had had an accident as well. So for that first, um, the first for four or five months, um, there had been significant stress, uh, so temporary excesses had been required. At the annual review, um, the facility was increased another $100,000, um, but temporary excesses continued to be required, um, and uh, the, there was a another further extension to 270000 in 2013 in May. Um, at that stage, there was a view that the values of properties had um, had dropped. The, the, uh, from the perspective of the facility, the LVR covenant had been moved because the, um, the LVR covenant had continued to be breached, so um, we had increased the covenant. There was a belief that uh, moving to a 60% covenant, the, the LVR would be fine. However, when the valuation was commissioned, um, and that's the reason for the valuation being commissioned at that time. I want to take you through those events in turn, um, but it, throughout that period that you've just described, the Ruddies were struggling, struggling to make their repayments. Yes, they were struggling from the perspective of operating the, the, the um, so to put it in context, the farming income didn't cover yes. um, the outgoings um, on their account. Yes. All right, so Bankwest instructed the valuation of the properties on the 8th of May 2013? Yes, that's right. And valuation reports were prepared on the 9th of May for Sunrise and the 15th of May for Aaronfield? Yes. And in your statement, you say that the 2013 valuations were obtained as a result of findings from an annual review of the facilities conducted in May 2013? Yes. Now, you exhibit two documents in connection with that May 2013 annual review, an Agri Model Credit Risk Review document and a Bank West Business Credit Fate document. Yes. Uh, and are those, the, are those the documents that record the review that was conducted in May 2013? So the, um, there's the Agri model paper, which is the annual review. The FATE is the credit risk officer's assessment of that annual review. So an annual review, just like an application, has to be approved by a risk officer. I see. Uh, so those documents are dated the 21st of May, the annual review document, and the 22nd of May, the credit risk review of that document. Yes. So why do the valuations predate those documents? Uh, the annual review would be put together over a period of time. So at the, uh, all I can assume from my review is at the point in time where um, the banker made the call, so similar to what happened in 2012, he would have made inquiries um, with regards to the value of the property. I believe he got two, um, 
two valuers provided him with feedback of comparable sales that had happened the year prior that showed a decline in value, that, um, and that would have triggered him to then request the valuations while he was completing the annual review. I see. Now, uh, could we, before I turn to the valuations, just look at the two documents that you've described, the one that records the review and the credit risk review of that document. Uh, so if we start with uh, the um, document which is Exhibit 80 to your statement, CBA 000860860. So uh, There we are. Um, this is the Agri Model Credit Risk Review. Yes, that's right. So this is the document that records the annual review. That's is that right? right? Yes. Uh, and we see from page zero eight six six that it was prepared and re recommended by, as well as supported by Gary Douglas. Do you see his name appears in both those places? Yes, that's right. And who was Mr Douglas? Uh, he was the relationship manager at that time. And was it common for a credit risk review to be prepared and re recommended by, as well as supported by, the same individual? So that's not the credit approval? No, um, I understand that. Yeah. But what's the purpose of these distinctions between preparation and recommendation and support? From my understanding, if a, if a more junior member of staff, like an assistant relationship manager, completed the review, the I see. the re, um, the relationship manager will actually check it. But Mr. Douglas was of a sufficient level yes. of seniority yes, he that was. he could fulfil both those roles. Yes, he could. And at zero eight six four, we see that at the time this report was prepared, the Ruddy's LVR was 57%. Do you see that towards the bottom of the page? Four percent Do you see in the security summary? Oh, yes. LVR, 57%? Yes. And as a point of comparison, um, in the August 2012 annual review, it was 51%. Yes, that's right. Now, I want to put to you, you've, we've read this document, yes. that the tenor of this document was that things had become more difficult for the Ruddies since the loans were approved, but that their file was still under control. Yes. And the document records that Mr Ruddy was seen as a well-established grazier with a satisfactory track record and in-depth knowledge of the industry. Yes, he was. Yes. He provided financial data when requested. Yes. The relative high number of irregular days with amounts was considered nominal. Yes. Uh, borrower is proactive in alerting bank to any overdrawings ahead of time. Yes. Uh, there's also references in this document to the borrower having two doses and a diversified income stream. Yes. He's actively seeking to take on additional dozer works given current dry conditions and poor cattle prices. Yes. So the plan as at the date of um, this document was that Bankwest would amend the LVR to 60% and that's described in the document as being to provide the Ruddies with minor headroom should the revaluations deteriorate slightly. Yes, that's right. There was also a comment um, in relation to the borrowers had made a strategic decision not to sell cattle given the, um, the market um, and therefore there would obviously therefore be a requirement for some additional headroom for the Ruddies. And the document records that in the event that the proposed covenant was breached following the revaluations, the matter would be reported to business credit for further strategy and sanctioning. Yes. Okay. And the Ruddies had to, they had agreed to formulate a strategy following receipt of the revised uh, valuations. That's what, yeah, the paper says. 
And then the second document you annexed dealing with the review at this time is the credit fate document behind tab 81, CBA 4000094 Yes. So what's a credit fate document, Ms Taylor? So this is a document when um, the annual review and or a credit paper are submitted to risk. The risk officer um, will review that paper and make comments on, um, well, a approve or decline and make comments for the relationship manager about the credit department's view on the application. So was this document also prepared by Mr Douglas? Uh, well, no, the comments would not be Mr Douglas. They relate to the risk officer's comments. Yes, I see. And do we see the risk officer's name uh, in the approved by box? Is that right? Yes, Michael Creek. Yes. yes. Now, the tenor of this document was also that things had been difficult for the Ruddies, um, that their file was under control. I think the tenor of this document um, was a little more along the lines that they, uh, they were at the maximum um, from the perspective of their, uh, their ability to service mm. as well as um, the security position. So they were both, from my read, concerns about the cash flow position and concerns about security. And the final comment is comfortable with position as it stands, but let's see what revaluations produce. And if revised LVR is breached, then farm sales strategy may take on greater emphasis. Yes, which is the strategy referred to in the annual review. Yes. Uh, so uh, these are the documents from the 21st and 22nd of May 2013 in relation to the annual review. Uh, and shortly after that, on the 24th of May 2013, Bankwest issued two letters of variation to the Ruddies in respect of their facilities. Yes, that's right. Uh, now, those letters of variation weren't originally exhibited to your statement. Ah, uh, that's right. But you re-swore your statement on Sunday. Yes, and I did. And in this revised version of your statement, you exhibited those documents. Yes, I do. Following a notice from the Commission late last week to produce those documents. I wasn't aware there was a notice, but I believe we'd found the, the, all of the relevant documents um, over the period of putting the notice together. Um, my statement together, we found additional documents that we then attached. Um, uh, if Mr Sherry would like me to, I'm able to tender that notice if any issue is taken with that, but it doesn't appear that there is. Now, uh, having annexed those two documents as exhibits to your statement on Sunday, um, we can see now from exhibit uh, 28, I'm sorry, exhibit 83, 28A, I'm sorry, which is CBA 0517 the letter was issued on the 24th of May, uh, right after the two documents that we've just looked at. And we see here the offer to raise the LVR covenant to 60%, yes. consistent with those internal documents. Uh, and by this letter, uh, if we turn over to 4001, Uh, I need to take you to other pages to show you the overdraft facility increase. I'll take you to uh, your 28B at CBA 0517016740008. We see there that uh, the overdraft facility was increased from $260,000 to $270,000. Yes, that's right. So the LVR covenant was increased to 60% and the overdraft was increased from 260 to 270. 
Yes, that's right. It had been 200. Yes. There was a variation to 260 and then it was 270. That's right. It would have been 200 by the end of May had it not been for this variation. Yes, that's right. And the offer contained in these two letters of variation was specified to expire on the 24th of June 2013? Yes, that's right. And were the letters of variation signed by the Ruddies? Uh, I have no record of signed copies of the the origin the, of this variation. Have you seen documents that suggest that they were signed, Ms. Taylor? Um, I think uh, yeah, I have seen a document where Mr. Ruddy said he signed and returned them. We yes, haven't been thank able to you. locate them. Now, uh, can I take you then to the valuations, uh, which? had been prepared prior to this time, but don't seem to have informed these decisions. Is that right? Uh, Do you recall which the, decision, sorry? Uh, the decision to change the LVR covenant to 60% and offer the overdraft facility increase. So the, the decision to change the LVR happened in the annual review. That's right. Um, and was documented as a part of that in anticipation of the valuations. valuations. But the valuations had been received then or not? It was in anticipation of the valuations. I thought that was how you described it. Oh, yes, it. it was in anticipation. Yes, that's right. And then the valuations were received. Yes. After those decisions had been made. That's and right. can I take you to the Aaronfield valuation which is your Exhibit 78, CBA 4000-0094-1085. And we see there that Aaron Field was revalued at $900,000, uh, down from the $1.1 million dollar valuation uh, of the bank manager in 2011. Yes, that's right. And the Sunrise valuation uh, valued Sunrise at $750,000 down from the 1.2 million valuation done by the bank manager in 2011. Yes, that's right. So for Sunrise, more than a third of the value of the property had been wiped off. Yes. So the result of the revaluations was that the Ruddy's LVR was 77.6%. That's right, yes. And these two valuations cost a total of $6,600. That's right, yes. Now, the charging of the valuations to Mr and Mrs Ruddy's overdraft account posed somewhat of a quandary for Bankwest because the Ruddies didn't have enough money to pay for the valuations, did they? Uh, there had been a temporary increase affected to the account because the account was already overdrawn prior to the valuations being charged. Yes. Um, and uh, so that was already in place at the time the valuations were charged. Well, I, I want to take you to the strategy that Bankwest devised to deal with the situation where the Ruddies were already overdrawn at the time you wanted to charge the valuations to their account. Could I show you CBA 4000-0009617981798? Now, we see there an email chain and I'll ask you to look at the email at page 1799. This is an email from Gary Douglas to Mitchell Durack on the 13th of June 2013. Yes. Further to our discussions of yesterday regarding this client, I have discussed the situation at length with Nathan this morning. From Nathan's experience in GCS, group credit structuring, having managed several similar cases, he believes the below would be an acceptable outcome. One, advise the borrower that the letter of variation recently issued and signed, dated 24 May 2013, is null and void, as the outcome of the valuations has breached the 60% LVR covenant. Two, 
forbear the LVR breach, given that a new letter of Value of variation is issued, replacing the above to include or document the following strategy or triggers, borrower to be provided with a $270,000 uh, Agri-1 limit, we need to pay the $6,000 in valuations now due, undertakings to include borrower to provide bank with evidence of security property sales listing by 30 September 2013, a $50,000 debt reduction by 31st of December 2013, borrower to evidence to bank that they have executed a sale contract on security properties with it being unconditional by 30 April 2014, with a settlement date by 30 June 2014. So that the plan the bank came up with was to get rid of the letters of variation that had already been sent uh, to and signed by the Ruddies by declaring them null and void, forbear the resulting LVR breach from the valuations and issue a new letter of variation which, amongst other things, would increase the overdraft limit sufficiently so that the valuation fees could be charged. So I don't agree with that. You don't um, agree with that? I don't agree with that. Um, in my review of the file, um, the the increase to the overdraft, the 20,000 I was talking about, was a temporary increase mm -hmm. because there was, there was some cash flow constraints. From the perspective of the LOV, um, issuing the LOV with a, um, an LVR that had already been breached would mean that the customer was already in breach of contract. So whilst... Um, the way it is written, it may read like that. From my reading of the file, the reason that um, the documents were reissued was so that the, the LVR covenant was removed, so that would, there would be no LVR breach. And the 270 Agri-1 limit was not set up to solve for the, um, the valuations. That was the limit that had been agreed to be put in place. Um, and, and yeah, I, I haven't seen anything that would indicate that the bank was trying to pay its valuation fees by doing that. What about the line in the email that we see there, Ms Taylor? Borrower to be provided with $270,000 Agri-1 limit brackets, we need to pay 6000 in valuations now due. In reading the file, there, there was always the, an increase to the Agri-1 limit. That was always the plan to support the Ruddies. You don't know what was being referred to here then? Well, I can see that he's saying um, we need to pay six in valuations now due, but from all of the documents that I've reviewed, the intent was to increase the Agri-1 limit um, to support the Ruddies and to remove the LVR covenant so that they were not in breach. I want to put to you that that was all also with the purpose of permitting them to have enough funds that would allow you to recoup the costs of the valuations. I didn't see that as the intent. Well, let me understand what you mean by to support the Ruddies. What do you mean in this context when you say, as you did, that the increase in the OD was to support the Ruddies? So from the perspective of um, the, the Ruddies account, they had continued to require temporary excesses that were not able to be cleared because cattle sales were problematic. So by giving them an actual approved facility limit, they had the certainty of knowing that it was there versus having to constantly phone the bank. As you'll see, there's a note there around having to phone um, to get extensions because what was happening was they would phone for an extension as cheques were being presented. That is, the extension was the increase in limit was to help them pay uh, uh, debts that they uh, sought to pay. Yes, checks One of the debts present. they would have to pay was the 6000 odd for the uh, valuation. Yes. Uh, the increase in the limit uh, would permit payment of the 6000 in valuation. Yes, it would. What's the hesitation then about saying that uh, the increase in limit was in part to allow for payment of the valuation? 
I actually think the bank's intent throughout this entire case was to support the Ruddies, but I can see that that was that in reading that that it looks uh, as though the increase was for the valuations to be paid. Yes. The charges for the 2013 valuations were charged to Mr and Mrs Ruddy's overdraft account on the 14th and the 17th of June 2013? Yes, that's right. Uh, and you tell us in your statement that you've been unable to find any record of Mr or Mrs Ruddy being informed that the valuation fees were to be debited from their accounts. I actually did find um, since that time a reference uh, Mr Ruddy made when he uh, presented at the uh, primary production hearing where he said that the banker had phoned him and had basically explained that valuations would be done and that they would be charged as account. But have you found any record of Mr or Mrs Ruddy being informed before the money was taken out that it was about to be taken out? I haven't, no. No, because I think Mr Ruddy's evidence was that there were discussions between him and the bank about the fact that the bank wanted to do these valuations he said he didn't want the bank to do the valuations. Did you hear that evidence? Yes, I did. Um, now, uh, I'll tender that email chain, Commissioner. Uh, emails between Durack and Douglas, 13 June 2013, CBA 4000 0096179 becomes Exhibit 4.98. You accept in your statement that there was a failure to inform the Ruddies uh, that the valuation fees were to be debited from their accounts and that this was conduct that fell below community standards and expectations? Yes. Uh, and you heard Mr Ruddy's evidence that after the valuations were charged to their overdraft account, uh, they were left short? Yes. They lost about 80 head of cattle because they couldn't afford to feed them at this time? Yes. So I did also mention that there was a $20,000 extension to the overdraft mm -hmm. prior to this facility being funded so that there were funds available in the account. Now, uh, Mr Ruddy's evidence is that he was told by Bank West by phone in about June 2013 after the valuations that he was in breach of his LVR. I haven't found evidence of a call. Mm -hmm. You, you say in your evidence you haven't located any yeah. record of that no, call. I don't. Uh, and you say that customers are, ord are ordinarily notified in writing of any yes. covenant breach by Bank West. Uh, but I want to put to you that that email chain that I took you to, um, which is still on the screen, makes clear that Gary Douglas had been authorised to communicate the thrust of this message to Mr Ruddy. That message being that the 2013 letters of variation were null and void due to the breach, that Bank West would forbear the breach and offer a new letter of variation. Yes. And if we look at page 1798 in that email chain from an email that Mr Douglas sent the following day, we can see that Mr Douglas did telephone Mr Ruddy. You see that? Yes. Hi Mitch, I've had a discussion with Mr Ruddy this afternoon regarding the bank's position. Yes. Now, the letters of variation that were issued by Bank West in June 2013 materially altered the Ruddy's obligations to Bank West, didn't they? Yes, they did. The Ruddy's were required to list Sunrise for sale? Yes and they were required to make a debt reduction of $50,000 by the end of 2013. Yes. And do you consider that it was fair and reasonable for Bank West to rely on a revision to its own erroneous valuation to trigger a non-monetary default? It was not fair. Thank you. You accept that it was a breach of the requirement in the Code of Banking Practice to act fairly and reasonably towards your customers in a consistent and ethical manner? Yes. Now, in October 2014, Mr and Mrs Ruddy referred a dispute with Bank West to the Financial Ombudsman Service? Yes, he did. And the Ruddies disputed the manner in which Bank West had conducted the valuations and their reliance on the valuations in generating a default? Yes. 
and on at least two occasions after the Ruddies lodged this dispute, Bankwest requested that the dispute be ruled outside FOS's terms of reference. Yes. On the basis that farm debt mediation was a more appropriate place to deal with the dispute. That's right. Was this because Bankwest had concerns about the scrutiny that FOS would apply to the matter? I can't determine that from the file. It would appear at that time that was standard practice when it came to rural customers, that the belief was that farm debt mediation was a better um, route for resolution. And why was that? I haven't been able to find uh, the actual reason, but that was just the policy that they would actually write to FOS and request. Even where a customer had initiated a dispute in FOS? Yes. Uh, could I show you CBA I think your council would like to provide you with a hard copy of the document as well, which might assist because you can start having a look at what it is, Ms Taylor, while it's coming up on the system. We have it up on the screen now. <coughs> Could you tell us what this document is, Ms Taylor? Uh, this is a policy document for the GCS team. So how they um, basically, when a FOS complaint is lodged, what the GCS team do with any customer that's lodged a complaint. So it's a policy document for the group credit structure structuring yes. uh, team, dated the 2nd of July 2013. Yes. So this is um, a year prior to the Ruddies lodging their dispute with FOS. Yes. And we see in this document that Bankwest was at this time expressing concerns about how FOS might perceive its conduct after a dispute was lodged. Where are you referring to? I'll take you to paragraph 7. GCS managers should be mindful at all times of how they present their communication with customer. FOS does not look kindly on customer being informed by the bank that it no longer wants to retain their business. The strategy is exit only. An alternative communication could talk in terms that resonate with the customer, such as we are of the view that the best outcome for you is to realise the assets that support the loans to the bank with a view to repaying those loans. So that, that to, when I read it, um, relates to communication with customers, not a view that FOS may rule adversely to the bank. I'm talking more about uh, FOS's um, perceptions of the bank's conduct by reference to FOS does not look kindly on it's in my read, it's FOS does not look kindly on and it relates to the communication and the words that the GCS team use when mm. communicating to customers when they're in GCS. That's right. So it, this is guidance for the people in the team about how to communicate with customers once a FOS dispute is on fo foot because Bank West doesn't want FOS to not look kindly on those communications. I'd like to think that people considered communication with customers other than in relation to FOS. My read of it is not that, but I read it as, you know, that communication with customers should be 
done in a thoughtful way, not using language that banks use um, in these instances. But this is all about how the team should behave in the management of FOS complaints. We see that from the heading. Management yes. of FOS complaints. Once we have been advised that a customer has lodged a dispute with the financial ombudsman, here's the list of things we should do. And one of those is be mindful of how uh, a GCS person presents their communications with customers. Mm. So you're resisting my characterisation of this as being a document that shows concerns by Bank West about how FOS might perceive its conduct after dispute disputes with FOS are lodged. It's not how I read it. I tender the document, Commissioner. Can I describe it as a policy GCS team? It is a policy, yes. It is a policy document. Policy GS GCS team to July uh, 13, uh, management of FOS complaints, CBA 4000-0097-0952, Exhibit 4.99. Now, before the matter got to the recommendation stage in FOS, uh, Bankwest provided a written response to FOS dealing with some of the dispute details that had been provided by the Ruddies. Yes. Uh, that document is FOS 0030 Now, you've read this letter that Bankwest provided to FOS in response to the Ruddy's complaint? Yes. There is no mention of the 2011 valuations in this letter, is there? No, there's not. So by this time, the bank knew that the 2011 valuations had <coughs> been done in error by a bank manager who was inflating valuations and engaging in other forms of misconduct. Yes. But the bank chose not to acknowledge any of that to FOS. I would, uh, there are not many people left from Bank West from 2013 and I would assume what, what has happened here is a customer relations person submitting this information would, wouldn't have known that. That's all I can deduce. That's because they've also said an independent valuer, not Bank West. That's valuation. an assumption you make, is it Ms Taylor? That's the only explanation that I can give. Well, another explanation is that a decision was made not to tell FOS those things. No, I. I do not believe, believe that that's the case. Well, how do you know that, Ms Taylor? Well, the, there would be no benefit to the bank in doing that. I, I genuinely don't believe that had that been realised that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be noted. So, in response to the issue identified by the Ruddies of incorrect valuation of the property, all that the bank told all that the bank chose to tell FOS was that the properties were valued by an independent valuer and not by Bank West. Yes. Was, was that a full and frank way to deal with FOS in response to the Ruddy's dispute? No, assuming that the person dealing with the dispute was aware of the issues with Mr. Cro sorry, the banker, given he had resigned and left. Well, uh, we see from the following page, 1859, that the person who wrote this letter was well aware that the banker had left the bank. At paragraph 6, the banker is no longer with the bank and has not been for some time. No, no, see, they would know that, he, that the bank was no longer with the bank, but not the circumstances under which they left, necessarily. Wouldn't they look into the circumstances surrounding his departure? You, you say you've only had a small number of FOS matters uh, that we saw your table right at the start of your evidence. A very small number of agricultural customers have taken their matters to FOS. And here's one where the banker has left the bank, um, uh, the banker who performed the valuation that led to all of these problems. And the person who made the response to FOS uh, didn't look into the circumstances of his departure. 
So they would have looked at the timing and the state, realised that we had exited Queensland and the eastern states and would not have, and would have assumed that that was, I assume, would have assumed that that's part of that. Um, and this person replying with this letter would have dealt with the um, relationship manager in GCS, who would have provided the majority of the information, I would assume. Well, is that good enough, Ms Taylor? The, the, well, the valuation should have actually been, it should have been realised that the valuation was incorrect earlier, but no, they could have made inquiries, yes. Bankwest also told FOS in this letter on the first page, back to 1858, down the bottom of the page, paragraph one, the dispute is as a result of monetary default and not LVR default. Yes. The bank acknowledges that there had been an LVR covenant breach, however, the covenant was subsequently removed from the letters of variation. Yes. Now, was that, was that the right way to describe what had happened? So there were numerous monetary defaults on the account. Mm -hmm. uh, the account was transferred to GCS on the basis of, well, it wasn't the LVR covenant breach, it was on the basis of the fact that the temporary excess was not due to be cleared by the due date. Uh, an okay. additional $25,000 had been provided, I believe it was in November. Now, uh, I tender this document, Commissioner. Inquest response to FOS, Ruddy, 13 April 15, FOS 0030 0001 Exhibit 4.100. Now, having read um, the documents showing the way that Bankwest interacted with FOS in the course of this dispute... Can I just interrupt you there and just whilst we have this document on the file, oh, on the screen, Ms Taylor, let it be assumed that the author of the letter, one, did not know uh, of the history concerning the particular banker and two, did not find record of that history on the file. Does that invite attention to whether when a banker leaves the organisation in the circumstances in which this banker left, there should be some process where uh, the files that he or she has dealt with are flagged and connected with the uh, uh, questions of difficulty that uh, surrounded departure? Yes, they, well, there should be some. Not, we now note um, those instances on the HR system so that we do know, um, uh, you know, the reason why someone left, um, but the, the potential to flag a customer as um, being a file that should be of note. Uh, it, it's be not so much flagging on the HR, it's flagging no, on no. The, the customer files. This is a customer of Banker X who left the organisation in circumstances that directed attention yes. to yes. valuation practices. Yes, I agree. Now, uh, is that a step that's been taken? Is uh, it a step that can be taken? Certainly a, te a step that could be taken, yes. But has not? Has not, no. Yes. Uh, Ms Taylor, you've looked at the documents that show the way Bankwest engaged with FOS <coughs> through the course of this dispute. Yes. And do you accept that Bankwest delayed in providing information that was sought by FOS in its processes of dealing with that dispute? I think there, were, um, there was time, obviously, in between communications. I can't ascertain from our review of the file whether there was, you know, it can take time for people to get information. So. I can't make an assertion of it as to whether or ascertain whether or not there was a delay strategy. Well, can you see resistance demonstrated by Bank West in response to requests for information from FOS, which FOS expressed exasperation with? Yes, I did see that. Thank you. Now, FOS issued its recommendation on the 21st of August 2015. Yes. And you've exhibited that recommendation to your statement as Exhibit 57, 
CVA 4000-0093-0042. Now, um, the recommendation was on the screen in Mr Ruddy's evidence yes. before. Uh, the key pages are 0045 and 46 within the recommendation. If we could have both of those on the screen. We can see that the FOS case manager made two material findings against Bank West. Yes. And the first was that the bank manager had overvalued Sunrise in October 2011. Yes. But this didn't render the lending inappropriate. Yes. And in respect of the cause of the valuation, FOS found that it was more likely than not that the bank manager used the wrong land size to complete the valuation. Yes. And the second material finding was that given the flawed September 2011 bank valuation, uh, the bank should not have relied on the 2013 valuation to require the Ruddies to make a principal reduction to reduce debt and to sell the properties. Yes. And at 0052, in respect of the LVR covenant issue, we see under the heading the LVR covenant was breached at the outset. Yes. The case manager found that having regard to the flawed internal valuation in 2011, the LVR covenant was breached at the outset. Although the parties agreed in October 2011 that the applicants should main an LV maintain an LVR of 50% or less, and their contract included a condition precedent and less waived, that Sunrise should be valued at at least 1.2 million, these terms were breached from the commencement of the lending. For the reasons set out above, the value of Sunrise in October 2011 is likely to have been in the order of 750,000, resulting in an overall LVR at that time of 60.54%, which breached the prevailing 50% LVR term. Yes, um, but on the 750,000, um, FOS valued the property at 750,000 in both 2011 and 2013. Mm -hmm. If you look at Sunrise, uh, sorry, at Ironfield, the property values changed over time. So I do believe that it's um, it's an incorrect assumption that the value of Sunrise was the same at 2011 as it was at 2013. It would have been a higher value. Well, that was the finding of FOS. Yes. And FOS also found. Uh, later down on this page, that given Bank West's reliance on its flawed 2011 valuation, it was not appropriate for it to rely on the breached LVR when calling in the debt on agreed terms in the June 2013 valuation. Yes. You see that FOS says that Bank West said it relied at all times on the applicant's monetary default and whether there is an LVR issue is irrelevant. This is incorrect. In its initial response to the applicant's dated 4 November 2014, the bank said it required valuations in 2013 as part of its annual review of the facilities. These valuations resulted in an LVR breach and subsequently the customers signed letters of variation on 26 June 2013. These letters of variation required the listing of the security properties for sale principal reductions and unconditional sales contracts by the 31st of March 2014. Yes. So FOS rejected the, the bank's characterisation of having relied on a monetary default and found that the LVR breach was the basis for the issue of the 2013, June 2013 letters of variation. Yes. Now, the Ruddies didn't accept this recommendation. No, they did not. As you heard, the matter proceeded to determination. And you've annexed the determination to your statement as well. Um, behind Exhibit uh, 60, CBA 4000-0096-0422. 
Now, for the most part, we'll see when this comes up on the screen, but we'll see if you're able to answer this before it does, uh, Ms Taylor. For the most part, the Ombudsman endorsed the case manager's findings. Yes. Uh, including the findings about the flawed valuation in 2011 and about Bankwest's reliance on the non-monetary default in 2013. Yes. And FOS also made two further ancillary findings that were in the Ruddy's favour. Yes. And they related to interest charges. Yes. And they resulted, if accepted, in um, an obligation on the part of uh, uh, Bankwest to reduce the overdraft account balance and credit $2,000 to the overdraft account. Yes. And the Ruddies didn't accept the determination. That's right. Which meant that that obligation was not binding on the bank. That's right. But did the bank nonetheless proceed to reduce the overdraft account and credit that amount to the Ruddies account? No, we moved straight to farm debt mediation from my understanding. And we so, made many concessions there. I'm sorry? And we made many concessions there. There. Yes. All right. So at this time, you chose not to um, comply with the direction from FOS, which was not a mandatory direction. Yes. Uh, and as you've told us in your statement, and as we discussed earlier, the Ruddies aren't the only uh, agricultural Bank West clients uh, to have had a recommendation or determination made wholly or partially in their favour at FOS. Yes. Uh, now, could I ask you to look at uh, CBA 4000 Now this is another FOS determination. Uh, now, unless there's a hard copy for you here, which is coming, you won't be able to see the applicant's name, but this is a document that was provided to you in advance of you giving evidence. Have you read this document, Ms Taylor? I just need to check which name's on it. I assume I have. Yes, I have. So you're familiar with this determination? Yes. Which was a determination in favour of a Bankwest customer? Yes. And the applicants in this dispute uh, had a, a number of bases to their claim, including that Bank West had misled them in respect of a loan contract because they thought that the term was greater than a particular period. Yes. And FOS rejected that complaint. Yes. But they also raised an issue about the appropriateness of Bank West relying on the difference between a 2010 valuation and a 2013 revaluation of a property to force an LVR breach. Yes. Now, uh, on the face of the determination, there's nothing to suggest that issue is taken with the correctness of the 2010 valuation, but for completeness, the 2010 valuation was in fact completed by the same bank manager, wasn't it? Yes. But the FOS determination was focused on the appropriateness of the 2013 method of valuation in this case. Yes. And FOS found that because of the defects in the valuation method in 2013, Bankwest wasn't entitled to rely on the 2013 valuation for any purpose including uh, for a breach of the LVR ratio. Yes. So the circumstances of these applicants had some similarities to the Ruddies. Yes. And so does this FOS determination indicate to you that Bankwest uh, had broader issues with relying on flawed valuations to trigger breaches of LVR covenants? So in relation to this, uh this case, the valuation wasn't flawed. It was the way that the valuation was conducted was the dispute. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of ways you can value land and the way that the land was valued in this instance was different to the way that it was valued in 2011 and that created the differential. 
So do I take from that that this doesn't suggest to you that there are broader issues in Bank West about relying on incorrect or otherwise flawed valuations to trigger breaches of LVR covenants? I, I don't, no, I don't believe that's the case. And is this one of the three FOS matters that you identified in your statement as having got to the recommendation or determination stage wholly or partly in favour of the customer over the last 10 years? I would believe it is, yes. Which one is it, Ms Taylor? You describe each of them in paragraph 32 of your statement. Paragraph 32 is uh, CBA 9000000011. Yeah, I, I doesn't look like it is one of the three. It doesn't, does it? No. So you, in your statement, told the Commission that only three FOS complaints made by agricultural uh, customers reached recommendation or determination wholly or partly in favour of the customer over the last 10 years? Yes, and we did a manual review of all files to get to that number. So you missed this one? It would appear we did, yes. And this is the one that looks a lot like the Ruddy's case. It, it's actually not a lot like the Ruddy's case there. You referenced an uh, inaccurate valuation. It's not an inaccurate valuation. It's a, it's a different way of valuing. Well, it involved the same bank manager. Yes. And it involved use of a 2013 valuation uh, uh, to breach to force an LVR breach based on the difference between the 2013 valuation and a 2010 valuation. Yes, that's correct. But you didn't include reference to it in your statement? It was not found when we did the manual review of all of the files. I tender a copy of that FOS determination, Commissioner. How do I describe it? Ms Orr, FOS determination case 38, they, I think, was on the front page. Well, we could describe it as a determination on the 25th of November 2014. Much better. Thank you. Okay, FOS determination 25 November 2014, CBA 4000107, 3290, 4.101. Now, Commissioner, the, I've finished that topic. I still have at least two further topics to go to, and I see the time. I, I don't think I can finish with oh. this witness today. Uh, well, need, I'm afraid, then, to bring you back, Ms Taylor, but can we begin at 9.30 tomorrow? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, we'll begin at 9.30 tomorrow. Commissioner, can I respectfully ask how much extra time we need? The, the difficulty is that um, Ms Taylor comes from Perth. She has a young family. She's been involved in this for weeks now and if it's possible to finish tonight we would very much appreciate it. We have been told several times that it's expected that she would finish tonight. I'm surprised by that Mr Sherry but there we are. Uh, what do you I, say Ms I Orr? think I've got up to an hour Commissioner. Well I'm not sitting that long no, uh, I understand, Mr sir. Sherry. That's uh, it's not surprise. fair to the witness. <laughs> no it's, uh, it's no. not fair to the witness. I was really trying to clarify whether it was 10 minutes or an hour yeah. or two hours. Yeah. Some of the estimates have been pretty inaccurate, I should say, with respect to... Uh, Mr Sherry, do you want to think about that statement again? Yes. It is the fact, mm. sir, that witnesses have cooperated to an extraordinary extent and the estimates of when they'll be required and where has changed a lot. I've noted what you said, Mr. Thank you, sir. Sherry. Thank you, sir. Uh, it may surprise you uh, then to know that very careful attention is uh, given.
to trying as best we can to minimize disruption. Now, do we always succeed? No, we don't. I accept that. I know we don't always succeed. But we do try. Yes, sir. I'm 30 tomorrow. Commissioner, before I proceed with the cross-examination of Ms Taylor, there are two preliminary issues. Uh, the first is that I wanted to, to say something about some questions that I asked of Ms Taylor yesterday afternoon. I asked Ms Taylor about the circumstances in which she came to exhibit the documents that are Exhibits 28A and 28B to her statement, and Ms Taylor accepted that those documents were not exhibited to her original statement they were added when she re-swore her statement on Sunday. I then asked Ms Taylor whether she exhibited those documents as a result of having received a notice to produce from the Commission. And Ms Taylor said that she wasn't aware that there had been a notice. And I indicated that I could tender the notice uh, if issue was taken. Now there was a notice to produce seeking those documents issued by the Commission but we now understand that the notice was served on Bank West lawyers shortly after they had provided a draft version of Ms Taylor's statement that exhibited those additional two documents, and we want to make that clear. Yes, thank The you. second preliminary issue uh, uh, arises from another notice to produce that was issued by the Commission to Bank West on the 8th of June. That notice to produce was returnable on the 14th of June. Overnight, we have been provided with nine documents uh, that Bank West accepts ought to have been produced under that notice to produce. We have reviewed those documents this morning and I wish to ask Ms Taylor questions about those documents. The documents need to be redacted uh, to remove customer names and the name of the bank manager who has been the subject of some evidence. And I understand from Mr Sherry that they are in the process of being redacted so that they can be uploaded onto the system. They are not yet in redacted form on the system. So I think, unfortunately, it will be necessary for us to take a short adjournment to allow them to be uploaded in a usable form before I ask Ms Taylor questions about them. How long do you need? Uh, I should first of all apologise for that. We received them yesterday from a business um, when? Yesterday, um, sometime before 10.30pm, I saw them... When? 10.30pm yesterday, sir. Yeah, you said shortly before, did you? Yeah, well, uh, I was sometime told... Sometime before you said, my yes. question was, when did, I, I you, can find did that your out. solicitors receive them? I can find that out. Yes. I, I was told at 10.30pm. I saw them this morning at about just after 5am. Um, when Mr McGuinness had sent them to um, solicitors instructing. But I'll find out when they receive them, Your Honour, um, Commissioner. Um, Mr McGuinness has gone out to try and find out where they are. I know people have been redacting them this morning and uh, we do regret that this has happened. How long do you need to redact them? Could I seek instructions, Commissioner? Yes. Commissioner, I'm instructed that they'll be here in 15 minutes in redacted form. Can I come back at 9.50? Will that be sufficient time? Yes, sir. Well, I'll adjourn until 9.50. <coughs> <coughs> Commissioner, I've sought instructions about the documents. Um, I'm told that the person who located them in Perth yesterday was the person who was looking for the document about the culture review. Do you recall that evidence yesterday? Secondly, I'm told that they were provided to the solicitors in Brisbane at 4pm. 
and that the first task that was undertaken was to check whether they had already been produced. You say they were provided to the solicitors in Brisbane at 4pm. Yes, sir. By that, do you mean that no other uh, person in those instructing you had access to them before that time? That's my Very understand. careful answer, Mr yes. Sherry, and I don't want there to be some misunderstanding. Uh, when did your solicitors receive these documents? My instructions are 4pm, but may I check that, sir? Yes, do. That's correct. That is correct, sir. They're our instructions. Yes. And the documents are, or the fact that there are extra documents are, uh, is told to the uh, Commission at 10.51 p.m., is that right, that day? Well, I thought it was early this morning, sir, oh, 10.51 p.m. And redacted versions were then made available at 12.24 a.m., is that right? Yes, I redacted for privilege, but not redaction for the names. I understand that. Yeah, that's the, that's the difference, sir. And that's what we've been waiting for this morning. And just to be certain, you say that your solicitors first had these documents at 4 p.m. yesterday. They are absolutely our instructions, sir. Yes. yes, I understand that. Very well, I will consider what follows from this course of events. So go on, Ms Orr. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, uh, could we start? Ms Taylor, I want to show you the notice to produce under which these documents were sought. That is RCD 0002 0014385. Now, I understand, Ms Taylor, you've been shown the nine documents this morning, is that right? Uh, yes. yes. Now, this is the notice to produce served by uh, the Commission on uh, CBA on the 14th... I'm sorry, I'll take you to the third page, 4387, issued by the Commissioner on the 8th of June. And if we go back to 4385, returnable on the 14th of June. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And it required production of a number of categories of documents. Could I ask you to look at subparagraph C at the bottom of the page in relation to paragraph 22 of the statement? And then could we go over to the following page, 4386? The notice sought any documents recording the circumstances in which the bank manager left CBA? Yes. Can you accept that there are documents amongst the nine that meet that description? They are documents recording the circumstances in which the bank manager left CBA? Yes. Thank you. And we see down the page category L, any documents recording any complaint made by any CBA customer in relation to the bank manager. Do you accept that there are documents amongst the nine that meet that description? Yes. And category M, any documents recording any reports or investigations by or for CBA in relation to the bank manager? Do you accept that the documents include documents that meet that description? Yes. So the nine documents ought to have been produced under this notice to produce. Yes. I tender the notice to produce, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.102, notice to produce number 653, RCD 0002 0001-4385. Now, the documents that were found yesterday include the resignation letter of the bank manager. Is that right, Ms Taylor? Yes, it is. Now, if we could have that brought up, CBA 4000110026. This is the bank manager's resignation letter. Yes. And we see in the second paragraph down, the bank manager tells Bank West, my decision to resign from Bank West has not been made lightly, but has been greatly influenced by a number of factors which you and I discussed. These factors are, and then the first one is, 
at the conference in last November, you mentioned to us all that there was going to be a significant change within our business around early February. This statement provided me with a great deal of uncertainty around my future and it simply made me nervous. As you are aware, I commenced looking for opportunities outside of Bank West at that point. Now, what was the significant change within the business around early February of this year, Ms Taylor? I've had limited time, obviously, to look into this, but from my understanding, this will relate to the, um, the strategy that I talked about yesterday in relation to the um, exit of the East Coast agri-market and moving the uh, customers to different locations. Now, what would have given the bank manager, um, what would have created uncertainty for him around his future flowing from that change? I would assume that he was referring to the closure of the Toowoomba Business Centre. Yes, I see. And that's the uh, second, related to the second matter that he raises in this letter. He says, I'm not fully in agreement with the new R&R &R strategy. Is that rural and regional? It is, yes. I am struggling with why so many offices and ones such as Bundaberg and Dubbo, centre of New South Wales with both Landmark and Elders having their state offices based there, had to close. I'm also concerned with the actual level of staffing within Toowoomba office. When I joined Bank West Toowoomba, there was seven staff in the office and now there'll be three. I can't see how three staff are going to be able to process the amount of work required for this office to be successful going forward. So at that point, it seems that the Toowoomba office was to remain open. Yes, it would appear so. Uh, but other bank mark, uh, uh, sorry, other Bank West branches uh, have been closed. Uh, business centres, not yes, necessarily business centres. Thank you. And the final factor that the bank manager refers to uh, relates to um, uh, a particular person. Uh, who was going to be Mr. Uh, going to be the bank manager's direct manager, uh, and he had been told that he was no longer going to be his manager. Is that right? Yes, that is. All right. So these were the matters that the bank manager raised upon his resignation from Bank West. Yes. I tender that letter, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.103, Manager's Resignation Letter, CBA 4000-0010-0026. Now, I asked you questions yesterday, Ms Taylor, about the conduct issues that were identified by Bank West uh, prior to and around the time of uh, the bank manager's departure yes. from Bank West. Now, are you able to tell us how those issues were detected by Bank West? So from my understanding, uh, the issues were detected from a phone call from uh, the, one of the customers uh, in relation to the transfer of funds that I mentioned yesterday that customer was phoning to um, ascertain where their interest payment was on their term deposit. I see. And could I show you CBA 4000110241? And if I could ask you to, to direct your attention to the email that commences at the bottom of that page, and if we could have the subsequent page on the screen at the same time. Uh, the date of this email, I assume, is in the American form. I assume that this is the 2nd of April rather than the 4th of February, given the content of this email. Is that a fair assumption, Ms Taylor? I, I've, given I've just seen it this morning, I, I don't know, but it would be a fair assumption. Well, these relate... The email is uh, given as Tuesday, 03 April. April. Yeah. So the 2nd of April email is from Mark Alal. Is that his name? Mark Alal to a, a number of people within Bank West on the 2nd of April, and it relates to the Toowoomba office, Queensland Rural and Regional. Uh, and we see there that Mr Alal refers to a teleconference that he's had with the recipients of that email. And he says, a number of significant issues have arisen within the Toowoomba portfolio in the final week of the bank manager's employment last week and since. These have been highlighted by gaining access to the bank manager's mobile phone and team member feedback. So having read this email, Ms Taylor, does it appear to you that uh, members of Bank West took control of the bank manager's mobile phone 
So my understanding is he would have left and when um, a banker leaves, they hand over their mobile phone mm -hmm. for continuity of relationship. So if customers do call on that number, they will um, they would have retained for that purpose. I believe the relationship manager was taking the calls on that phone. So having obtained access to the bank manager's mobile phone, a number of issues with his conduct were identified from material on the phone? No, so I think this relates to the call from the customer in relation to the um, transfer of monies and the interest on the term deposit came in on his phone. Well, what, how do we understand then, what do we understand the sentence to mean? These have been highlighted by gaining access to the bank manager's phone. So access meaning the the phone was now in the hands of the relationship manager, no longer the banker, so she was taking the calls from the customers. So the, what do you understand from this was highlighted by gaining access to the phone? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand what you're asking. I'm, I'm just asking for your understanding of what that sentence means. These have been highlighted, these being the issues that I'm going to take you yes. to, the conduct issues that are identified below, they have been highlighted by gaining access to the bank manager's mobile phone. So my understanding is that by t the banker would normally obviously answer their own phone and take the calls, yes. and so therefore any uh, anything <coughs> that was happening on those calls, no one else would be privy to because the relationship manager had the phone, uh, the information was uncovered in the discussion with the customers, and that's what I understand that to mean. So do you understand this to be referring to conversations that the person who took over the phone had with customers yes. subsequent to his departure from the yes. bank manager's departure? Yes. Okay, I understand. And then we see the issues that are identified that have been highlighted by that access and from team member feedback. Now, some of these I asked you questions about yesterday, others I did not because they were not clear on the documents that we had been provided with at that stage. Um, number four relates to a potential conflict of interest in a significant number of transactions being referred by a relative of the bank manager. Is that right? Yes, it does say that, yes. 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 And do you see at number five that there was a statement which was still to be confirmed that the bank manager and his relative owned 600 head of cattle which were adjusted on a customer's property? Yes. And you see the email records, these are one of the customers that required an urgent approval and settlement last week. Potential conflict of interest, exclamation mark. Yes. So that was identified as a further issue with the bank manager's conduct? Yes. A significant conduct issue, do you agree? Yes, I do. Uh, and then number six, it appears that the bank manager prepared a significant proportion of cash flow budgets and SOPs on behalf of that customer. Yes. And that leaves the question open in relation to the customer's ability to prepare those budgets and the reliability of year in, year out and actual stock numbers. Yes. And we see further down uh, after there's a detailed examination of some of the other conduct issues that we discussed yesterday, including the term deposit transfer and the verbal approvals um, that had been given by the bank manager. You see underneath that the paragraph, whilst we should be able to minimise any fallout on most of the above groups, the above groups are his customers, is that right? Yes, I, from this I would say yes. My concerns centre on how many more potential issues reside within the portfolio. Without an in-depth review, it is difficult to estimate. Yes. And there's a series of action items, one of which is that Mr Alal is to take control of the mobile phone and handle all customer complaints and dialogue with the above listed connections. Yes. Now, I tender that document, Commissioner. Give it 4.104 emails between Lull, Watson and others at Bankwest 2 to 3 April 2012, CBA 4000 Exhibit 4.104. I just want to be clear um, uh, that your answers today um, 
I want to be clear on when Bankwest learnt of this misconduct. Um, some of this misconduct was uh, conduct that Bankwest was aware of before the resignation of the bank manager, wasn't it? So my understanding in reviewing the files is that the trigger for the discovery of the misconduct was at the time that that call was intercepted. Mm -hmm. And um, are you aware uh, that in the lead up, uh, in the week prior to the bank manager's resignation, uh, Bankwest re required him to finish up immediately and removed all of his system access prior to the date on which he was due to resign? No, I'm not, no. Mm. Could I show you a document that uh, tells us that? CBA 0002 I'll just I'll let you look at the first yes. page so that you can see that it's an email chain and then I'll direct you to the relevant page, which is uh, 0590. And do you see under action in the middle of the page, BDM, that's business development manager, and it's this bank manager who had resigned from the bank and was due to finish 30 March 2012, was finished up immediately and all system access removed, risk events were put to risk in sight? Yes. So do you agree that these issues were becoming apparent to Bankwest before the date of the bank manager's resignation? No, so when you resign, you give four weeks' notice. So he would have been on I his see. notice period at I the see. time that this was discovered. You're, you're referring to the date on which he tended his, his resignation. resignation. And then four weeks later, he would leave. And so they've uncovered and um, from this, it looks like um, exited him prior to his notice period being marked. Yes, so in that notice period, these issues were emerging. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry, I understand. Thank you. That, that document's already been tendered yesterday, Commissioner. Now, could I ask you to look at another of the documents provided to us overnight, CBA 4000110223. Now, this is the 2nd of April, so the same date as the email that I took you to before that referred to taking over access of the bank manager's mobile phone. This is an email from Belinda King, who took over um, from the bank manager. Uh, you'll recall the evidence that she became the Ruddy's bank manager mm. after the, the departure of the bank manager. So she was always on that portfolio, yes. so she would have dealt with all of these customers, but yes, she took over on his departure, yes. Yes, and his departure was a few days prior to this email. Uh, and we see that she's um, referring to a 30-minute discussion, which you will have seen from the unredacted version of this document, was a discussion with a customer, yes. a customer who was not um, Mr Ruddy. Yes. Uh, and we see that she says, I've attached my notes that are brief, but outline the points that that other customer raised. I must say he was very reasonable and more than willing to work with us on a resolution as he wants a win-win situation. I didn't comment on anything. And arrange for Russell and Robert to be contacted tomorrow at 4 p.m. So. Separate that as she's not commenting on the circumstances in which the bank manager has left Bank West. I, I took it that she's not commenting on anything in relation to the customer issue, um, as she hasn't had a chance to look at it fully. I see. And we see a description of the customer issue in the third paragraph. This customer's main issue was around the valuations as the bank manager had apparently valued the property at 2.1 million. He would agree to having the property valued, I think, and also advised he would be prepared to reduce the purchase price to ensure Bank West can complete the finance. <coughs> so another customer dealing with valuation issues caused by the bank manager. Yes. Tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.105, uh, email from King Bank West to April 12, CBA 4000 
And we see from the documents we've received overnight, Ms Taylor, that the valuation issues in connection with this bank manager um, extended beyond inflated valuations. They extended to circumstances where there were incomplete valuations or no valuations at all undertaken to support finance applications. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and we also see uh, issues that uh, are apparent from the documents produced overnight in relation to uh, irregulars and dishonours. Do you recall that? Yes. And could I ask you to look at CBA 4000110583? Do you see under irregulars and dishonours the ongoing review of the Toowoomba portfolio has identified a number of customer groups that have had significant irregular and or dishonour history and that are now being transferred direct from Goodbook to CAM. CAM? That's uh, the Asset Management, yes. the GCS. And these include the following groups and the customer names are redacted but they are all customers of the bank manager? Yes. And the principal systems that this document records were in place to assist identifying these behavioural issues were Genesis and the monthly RPR and irregular reports produced by BWB risk reporting. Yes. So those are internal systems um, designed to de detect these sorts of problems? That's right, yes. Review of the RPR reports back to September 2011 reveals that the irregular and dishonour behaviours were not appropriately captured, which reduced its effectiveness as an early warning system. Only once in January 2012 was any of these accounts listed for dishonour behaviour. It should appear after five dishonours, and only once, December 2011, was one of these accounts listed for irregular behaviour should appear after 30 days irregular. You see that? Yes, I do. And initial investigations indicate that the bank manager was using the behaviour triggers function in Genesis to reset the dishonours to zero, thereby resulting in non-escalation on the RPR system. Yes. So that's a further form of misconduct on the part of the bank manager that was identified by Bankwest? Yes. Thank you. I tender that document. We got a date for it, Ms. Orr? No, unfortunately I don't, Commissioner. It is an undated document. Memorandum Toowoomba Business Centre Process Issues, CBA 4000110583, Exhibit 4.106. The final document uh, I want to take you to, Ms Taylor, is CBA 0002 the final of the documents provided overnight. So this is a briefing note described as briefing with Jenny prior to meeting with Harrison Young. Yes. And it's undated, but we can see from uh, dates that appear in the document uh, that it, it must be dated uh, after the 23rd of April 2012 and before the 3rd of May 2012. I had a very brief look this morning, so yes. yes. Uh, who is Harrison Young, Ms Taylor? I have no idea. Well, Harrison Young, it appears to us, was on the CBA board at this time. Would that be right? Potentially, as I say, I only saw the document. I this can't morning. hear you. I'm so terribly sorry, Miss Taylor. You'll have to speak up. Sorry, I've only I only saw the document this morning. This is the first, you know, time I've seen it. So I, I have no context as to what this meeting is, mm -hmm. or who the parties to the meeting are. Mm -hmm. If you could flick through a few pages, I can have a look and try yes, and figure that course. out. So if we go to three nine three two. We see their Rural and Regional Banking Toowoomba Business Centre update as at the 23rd of April 2012. Yes. And do you see the reference to the operational risk incidents currently under review that we've been discussing? Yes. And do you see the reference to the most serious risk incidents 
yes. uh, issuing of two unconditional letters of finance approval when applications had not been approved by business credit and arranging and allegedly advising an elderly couple to prepay a term deposit of 350000 with the funds then directed to an unrelated customer. Yes. So these are the risk incidents in relation to the bank manager that we've been discussing. Uh, there were the risk insights that were put, uh, risk incidents that were put into risk insight yes. the risk management system. Yes. So certainly not the totality of the no. of the incidents in relation to the bank manager. No. Uh, and then we see a reference to initial investigation, and I asked you some questions about that investigation yesterday. Yes. And it identified a total of eighteen matters that required attention. Yes. And we see there uh, some of the matters that I've mentioned to you this morning, incomplete or no valuations undertaken to support finance application. Yes. And then I'll show you the following page, 3933, which gives a summary of the status in relation to particular customers who do not include the Ruddies. Yes. And the final page of the document, just so that um, you've seen the entirety of the document, 3934, deals with the scope for the Queensland targeted review. Yes. So having looked at the document now, what I want to put to you is that it, this is a briefing for the member, a member of the CBA board about the conduct of this bank manager and the investigation into the Toowoomba portfolio more generally that flowed from the conduct of the bank manager. Is, uh, is it possible to see the other pages that don't relate to Toowoomba so that... I, there there I, are no other pages. Oh, there aren't it's any? a four-page document, and I've now showed you each of those pages. I'm not aware that this would have been escalated. I'm not aware of that it would have been escalated to the board, and I can't tell from the title of the pack, given it's a meeting with Jenny, that wouldn't be a normal way mm -hmm. of documenting something that was going to the board. Well, let's look back at that first page again, 3931 to see the agenda for the meeting with this member of the CBA board. It includes APRA accreditation status. Someone's going to report to him on that. We see two individuals are going to report to him on the Queensland targeted review and Toowoomba update, which is what the document deals with. Do you see that? Yes, I do, yes. And someone else is going to report to him about Four Corners, CAM. Do you know what that's a reference to? No, I don't. Well, around this time in April 2012, Four Corners aired an episode relating to the conduct of Bankwest. Do you recall that? I didn't work at Bankwest at the time. I see. Uh, so you're not familiar with the piece on Bankwest about the takeover uh, that was called Happy Banking that was aired at that time? No. All right. But do you accept from this document, Ms Taylor, um, the matters that we have been discussing about the conduct of this bank manager and the Toowoomba portfolio more generally um, were escalated to Mr Young, a member of the CBA board. I can't make that assessment from this document. As I say, I've never seen a document escalated in that way to the board. To have a title that says briefing with Jenny prior to, meet, prior to meeting with Harrison Young would indicate to me that this is a meeting with these people, um, with Jenny, not with Harrison Young. To um, prepare for a meeting with a member of the CBA board. Potentially. Well, that's what it says, isn't it? Yes, it is, yes. Thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. Briefing note, Bank West. Uh, CBA 0002 Exhibit 4.107. Now, I, I said wrongly before, Commissioner, that I had tendered a previous document when I had not. So could I please tender CBA 0002 which is an email chain uh, entitled Status and Update on Toowoomba, dated 4 April 2012. Email chain status and update to Wumba for April 
2012, uh, CBA 0002. 21140587, Exhibit 4.108. Now, I want to return to the Ruddies, Ms Taylor. Uh, and as uh, we discussed yesterday, the Ruddies facilities were guaranteed by one of their sons. Yes. And the amount of that guarantee varied in the period that the Ruddies were Bank West customers. It did, yes. Now, if we go to Exhibit 10 to your statement, CBA 4000093-0246. Now, this is the letter of offer for one, uh, one set of the facilities. Uh, the facilities both in Mr Ruddy's name and Mrs Ruddy's name on the, 11, on the 21st of September 2011. And if we turn to 0249, we see that the initial guarantee given by the Ruddy's son, which is dealt with at 5.1 guarantees and indemnities, uh, related to the entirety of the facilities? Yes. And it was a guarantee in the sum of 795000 Yes. And if we go to the uh, other letter of offer at this time, your Exhibit 26, CBA 4000 0093-0255, which is the letter of offer for the facility um, in Mr Ruddy's name that was guaranteed both by Mrs Ruddy and by Mr Ruddy's son, we see at 0258 uh, that both um, Mrs Ruddy uh, and their son uh, guaranteed the entire amount of this facility, which was $325,000. Yes. So pursuant to these guarantees, um, Mr and Mrs Ruddy's son was legally responsible for paying back the entire facilities if there was default under the loans? Yes. And you heard Mr Ruddy's evidence yesterday um, that he had understood that his son's guarantee would be limited to his share of Aaron Field? Yes. But that was not the case in respect of either loan facility? At this time, no. And do you know why that was the case? I haven't found anything documented to indicate why it's been structured in this way. OK. Uh, the position then changed in July 2012, is that right? Yes, I did see an email on the file that said that the um, guarantee should be limited. Mm -hmm. uh, and in July 2012, there were letters of variation uh, that changed to what had previously been contemplated, which was that the Ruddy's son's guarantee would be limited to his share of Aaron Field? Yes. And what led to that change of position? I can't see anything. And there was a, a, one email from the relationship manager which just indicated that the change should be made. There's nothing documented to explain why it was changed in that instance. And that limited guarantee remained in force until May 2013? Yes. And in the May 2013 letters of variation, Bank West sought to reinstate the original position that Mr and, Midi Mr. Mr. and Mrs Ruddy's son would guarantee the full amount of each of the facilities? Yes. Uh, now, so... I just want to show you what the figures were at that time. If we go to your exhibit uh, 28B, CBA 0517-0167-4008. So this is the May 2013 letter of variation. And if I could ask you to look at 4010, this relates to the two facilities in Mr and Mrs Ruddy's names. We see at clause 5.1 that in respect of those facilities, Mr Ruddy's son's guarantee moved to the amount of $955,000 at that point. Yes. 
up from the original uh, $795,000. Yes. So it was $795,000 for these facilities originally, then it moved to uh, his share of Aaron Field, and then in May 2013, Mr Ruddy's son was guaranteeing 955000 on these facilities. Yes. And for the other facility, the facility in Mr Ruddy's name, the same thing happened. Uh, at this time, Mr Ruddy's son moved to being a guarantor for the entire, uh, entire facility, which was $325,000. Yes. So what was the basis for that change in May 2013? Again, in my review, I, f I haven't found any emails or any indication of the reason for those changes. So you can't explain that? Can't explain it. The this change in May 2013 was carried across into the June 2013 letters of variation that replaced these letters of variation. You recall those yesterday? Yes. So did Bank West use the LVR breach that flowed from the May 2013 revaluations as an opportunity to impose a more onerous position on Mr and Mrs Ruddy's son as guarantor? I don't believe so. I've found no evidence to support that. But, but you, don't, you don't know why it was done? I don't know why it was changed, no. But it was done at the time of the LVR breach? Yes. Was it common practice within Bank West to vary the amount of a guarantee on an almost yearly basis, as we've seen here? I'm not aware of it being common practice at that time. It certainly isn't, no. Mm -hmm. And are you troubled when you look at the changes of the value of the guarantee over this period? I'm troubled that the guarantee changed. You know, it was uh, it started off one way, changed, and then was changed back. Mm -hmm. There's no explanation as to why it wasn't maintained um, with the facilities that limited to his um, interest in Aaronfield. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Ruddy's son lodged a separate dispute with the financial ombudsman service about the guarantees. Yes, I believe he did. And he alleged that he hadn't been provided with information about the loans before signing the guarantees. Yes. And he said that he believed that his guarantee at all times was limited to his share of Aaronfield. Yes. Uh, but FOS didn't issue a recommendation or determination because the matter fell outside its terms of reference. That's right. Thank you. All right. Now, the, the, Fuddy, the Ruddies matter proceeded to farm debt mediation in August 2016. Yes, it did. And you exhibit to your statement a copy of CBA's farm debt mediation policy, <clears throat> and that's at Exhibit 7 to your statement, uh, CBA 00102430382. Now, uh, this is described in the document as, as at the 21st of August 2017. Yes. Is it the current version of CBA's farm debt mediation policy? From what I understand, yes. And you tell us in your statement that it's in materially identical form uh, to what it would have been at the time that the Ruddy's mediation took place? Yes. And we see at 0382, the first page, that the document sets out CBA's general approach to farm debt mediation? Yes. And what I want to put to you that in this document, like the document about dealing with FOS that I took to you yesterday, we see CBA expressing concerns about public perception in its handling of farm debt mediations. Sorry, I'm just trying to find that part. Could I direct you to the second paragraph in the document? Yes, I see a statement that says the bank uh, to handle matters with integrity and compassion. Well, what we see is a farmer's plight also attracts the sympathy of the Australian public, media and political parties. So how we handle the farmer's financial difficulty is often scrutinised by such forums and our brand can be at risk. Yes. So a concern about public perceptions in the way CBA handles farm debt mediations. 
think it, this, refer, from my read, refers to the way CBA handles farmers in difficulty as opposed to specifically what they're saying is agreement through farm debt mediation helps to achieve this. Well, this is in a document that relates to CBA's approach to farm debt mediation. Yes, it is. Yes. Then we see, therefore, it is incumbent on the bank to handle such matters with integrity and compassion, which doesn't mean we give them more money. Yes to ensure we do the right thing and our brand is protected. Agreements through farm debt mediation helps achieve this. Yes. So does CBA feel an imperative to settle matters at farm debt mediation? So um, I don't actually work in the area that deals with farm debt mediation. From the um, discussions that I've had with people that do, there is a commitment by CBA um, to utilise farm debt mediation to reach a, a resolution for both parties. Okay. That is fair and equitable. Now, broad agreement was reached between Bank West and the Ruddies at the farm debt mediation that they had. You tell us that in your statement. Yes. But following the farm debt mediation, there was a significant amount of back and forth between Bank West and the Ruddies representative about the details of the agreement? There was, yes. And that went on for a number of months? It did, yes. And on a number of occasions during that back and forth, um, the representative for the Ruddies expressed the view that the terms that Bank West was seeking to formalise in the deed uh, departed and uh, extended beyond what had been agreed on the day at the farm debt mediation. That's what they said, yes. And that was a contributing factor to the delay between the day of the mediation and the execution of the deed in October 2016. Yes, I spoke to the person from Bank West who attended. They thought there had been agreement on the day and there was a dispute post. So by the deed of agreement, the Ruddies agreed to sell Sunrise within six months and pay Bank West 75% of the net sale proceeds, as well as an additional 410,000 to discharge the Aaronfield mortgage. Yes. Uh, and you heard Mr Ruddy's evidence about the steps that he had to take to comply with that agreement and make those payments? Yes. And you heard his evidence that since that time he's been unable to refinance? Yes. Now, you were asked to reflect on Bank West's conduct in respect of Mr Ruddy in your statement. Yes. And you made a number of admissions of conduct falling below the community's and Bank West's standards and expectations. Yes. But you did note in paragraph 138A of your statement that notwithstanding the erroneous valuation, it was likely that Bank West would nevertheless have offered the facilities to Mr and Mrs Ruddy. Yes. And you say this is because, in your view, Bank West assessed the application appropriately, its assessment showed the repayments were affordable and the terms of the lending were properly disclosed. Yes, that was my understanding in reviewing the file. And that's the position that Bank West has maintained throughout, including before FOS? Yes. And in the farm debt mediation? Yes, and that was a determination made by FOS as well. Well, you accept that whether the whether Bank West would have offered the facilities is a very different question to whether the Ruddies would have accepted those facilities had they understood their true equity position. Yes. Thank you. All right. Now, in, in the final paragraphs of your statement, you reflect upon how Bank West's policies have changed since the original valuations that were obtained in 2011. Yes. And you say at paragraph 139 of your statement that Bank West would not deal with this in the same way today. Yes, that's right. Uh, but Bank West still permits internal valuations to be undertaken in respect of rural properties? Yes, it does. Okay. Now, could I ask you to look at uh, the current policy, which is Exhibit 88 to your statement, CBA 4000-0086-1404. Now we see there on the first page, 1405, uh, methods of rural valuation. We could have that blown up.
So Bankwest permits internal valuations to be conducted by both internally badged register valuers who are badged by commercial valuations business credit yes. and sales professionals. Yes. Now, do internally badged register valuers and sales professionals have KPIs relating to loan origination? Yes, they do. What are those KPIs, Ms Taylor? Uh, there's a 10% KPI for asset growth. Both for the internally badged register valuers and the sales professionals? The internally badged registered valuers, valuers are sales professionals. They are sales professionals yes. as well? Yes, they are. I see. Uh, so each of those categories of people who can conduct internal bank valuations have KPIs that include 10% for asset growth? Yes. And how are the internally badged register valuers meant to achieve asset growth? Uh, through uh, writing loans. Through writing loans? Yes. And same with the sales professionals? Yes. So the people who are conducting your internal bank valuations still write loans? Yes, uh, just on the sales professional though, the sales professional doesn't actually carry out evaluation. Um, you see if you read further down, they yes. can provide other sources of external um, valuation materials such as a sales note from an auction as as a, an actual proof of a value. It's yes. not that they go out and actually internally value a, a, do a property valuation. It's only the internally badged valuers that can actually go out and um, value a property. And they're the people that I mentioned yesterday have had the training to be able to do that and all of their valuations are checked by a registered valuer. So why are they listed here then as one of the two um, types of people who conduct internal bank valuations? The sales professional, you mean? Yes. It's, it's, I believe it's terminology because as you read through, the, the information they can use to provide that is actually external information from external sources. Okay. They can't do it themselves. The only people that can actually value themselves have to have done the qualification and um, have the be badged be on the list of accredited values, of which there are 11 mm -hmm. um, in Bank West currently, and they have to have all their valuations checked by an so, external value. So does Bank West consider that uh, giving these people who have KPIs related to asset growth the role of conducting internal bank valuations in either of the two ways you've described um, might place them in a position of conflict of interest? So as long as, so my view, as long as these are actually checked by someone else to validate that they're correct and all of the inputs are checked, um, which is what now happens, then um, they have been validated by another party who's not involved in that transaction and not rewarded for that transaction, then uh, I, I don't have an issue with it. So how does that person who checks them <clears throat> validate that they are correct? They're a registered valuer. They've been a registered valuer for 20 years. Mm -hmm. They compare against um, both external and internal data. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, refer I mentioned yesterday, we don't do a lot of internal valuations. There have been 24 over the last three years across the 11 registered valuers that we have. And in general terms, rural properties can be valued by the internally badged register valuers if the credit facility that's being offered is for 15 million or less? Yes, but the majority of those 11 have delegations far below that. What are their delegations? Uh, the delegations are three, five, and I think above 10. Now, you say in your statement that Bank West has implemented increased controls through the origination process, including a requirement that all valuations performed by internally badged valuers are to be reviewed and assessed by an independent risk professional within the risk management team. That's what you've just referred yes, that's to? What and they're a registered valuer, not just a risk professional. And where do we see that in this policy? I think it's on the next page. Okay, could we turn to 1406? Oh, sorry, maybe the last page. Yes, 
Yeah, if we could, I think it'll be the last page. 1407 is the second last page and 1408 is the last. Perhaps if they could both be on the screen. So the review and accuracy check is um, the random sample, which also happens. Mm -hmm. So that's something different. Yes, it is. A but random sample. There is there is a um, on the policy document that we have. It does note, and I have checked that it has the the check by the registered valuer who so, works in risk. So it's not in this document. It doesn't appear to be on this document. Well, but can it, we it, go back to? Uh, 1407 and you see there a table uh, beneath the table you see two notes and under the second of those notes valuations for rural properties greater than five million it must be co-signed in particular ways and then a second note what do I make of those uh, parts of the document uh, so th for for the, that one, um, if it, if it is over five million, there's a co-signing, um, which has to be done by one of the following, and the follow the teams are the state manager, senior relationship manager. So there's a co-signing of anything over five million. And the, the next note. The what? Sorry. And the next note. What do I make of oh, that? Oh, sorry. Yes, and and um, all of the valuations are sent to CVBC, which is the internal valuer who works in the risk department and is the person that has to approve all internal valuations. So is that what you're referring to, the forwarded to CVBC for their review? Yes. Must maintain a record of the review? And acceptance. And acceptance of all internally badged valuations. That's what you're That's referring right, to? That's right, yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, in... Just while you're interrupted about that, the review depends on the quality of the information they're given, I take it. It's a review on the papers, isn't it? It is a review on the papers. Yes. So, for example, the specification of the area of the land concerned is not something they check uh, separately? They would do a detailed check based on um, the information that they have been provided with and a comparison with others, but yes. Yes. So that system may not have picked up the errors with um, this bank manager's valuation. Well, I would say it would, because I picked up the errors in that valuation and I'm not a registered valuer or an internally badged valuer. But plenty of people in your organisation before you Absolutely. did not, Ms Taylor. You Absolutely. agree with that? I do agree with that, yes. Thank you. So in general terms, rural properties can be valued by the sales professionals, not the internally um, badged registered values, but the sales professionals, if the credit facility being offered is for 12.5 million or less? Uh, it's, yes, yes. And for valuations greater than 5 million, we saw from um, the part that the commissioner just took you to that the sales professional has to have the valuation co-signed. That's right, yes. But beneath five million, there's no requirement for that? If it's an internally badged valuation, it still has to go to the internal, uh, the registered valuer who sits in risk. They all go if they're internally badged. But, but these are not internally badged. I'm talking about the sales professionals. So the sales professionals are using external data from already registered yep. um, and authorised people. So therefore, they have the co-signing. Um, and that data will also be checked um, by risk when they do the credit application as well. But they only have the co-signing over five million. Not, yes, sorry, yes. Not below five million. Yes, that's right. Uh, now, I want to ask you about that random sample check on 1408, a random sample of valuations completed by sales professional, professionals is reviewed annually to check for accuracy and adherence to policy. <coughs> Yes. Um, so what are the matters that are being assessed in that random sample? So the random sample is a, a, a 
it's a sample of 10% of the valuations to ensure that they have been carried out correctly and that the data that's in them is accurate. Okay. Uh, and we see that the policy tells us that if a manager is found materially overstating a property value, the sales professional risks losing their valuation privileges and may ma face further action from the bank. Yes. <laughs> But there isn't an equivalent requirement in relation to the internally badged valuers? So the internally badged valuations, because they have that check by risk, they're returned to the business if they're incorrect. Um, we have a register of um, which a register of what we call LDA breaches, which is delegations breaches. So in the event that someone um, was seen to be having a significant number of errors with whether it be valuations or any other element of an application, um, that would be investigated and they would either be receive training or if the behavior continued, there would be uh, consequences both from the perspective of uh, their uh, STI, as well as it would affect their, obviously, their risk gate opener, which I talked about yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and it moves through seriousness to formal warnings and dismissal. So why does Bank West consider it necessary to specify for sales professionals to spell out in this policy that if they're found materially overstating a property value, they risk losing their valuation privileges and may face further action from the bank. Uh, from my perspective, to ensure that they understand the seriousness of getting, as with everything in an application, making sure that it's accurate um, and, this, and they know that it's actually being looked at and checked. That's the purpose of having these types of controls. But if there are risks like that inherent in allowing sales professionals to discharge the function, um, why does Bank West permit them to do it? Because the checks are in place to ensure that um, that any uh, adverse behaviour is caught. So under the current policy, it remains the case that someone in the position of the bank manager could complete an internal valuation in respect of properties such as Aaronfield and Sunrise? If they're internally badged, yes. If they're a sales professional, they would have to use external data. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that external data includes an external valuation that's 12 months old. Mm -hmm. And if they're badged, uh, at least one other Bankwest employee has to review it. If they're badged, it has to go to the registered valuer who sits in risk, yep. who checks every element of that valuation. Yes, okay. But as I've already pointed out to you, internal review by Bankwest was insufficient in 2012 to identify all the defects in these valuations, wasn't it? It was, but it's very different now. Mm -hmm. Now, Bankwest accepts that where a customer pays for a valuation, they should generally receive a copy of the valuation? Yes, that's correct. Uh, but Bankwest also um, tells the Commission that the customer should not receive a copy where providing them with a copy might negatively impact the sale price of the asset. Now, I'm reading that from submissions that were made to the Commission within the third block of hearings. Yes. Are you familiar with that document? I am, yes. So, the position of CBA and Bank West is that customers should not receive a copy of evaluation where providing them with a copy might negatively impact the sale price of the asset. Uh, the, I think the context of that comment related to enforcement action mm -hmm. and it specifically relates to the sensitivities around um, the price of the asset at that time and the potential for manipulation of the outcome in the event that the information was shared. I believe there was evidence given by CBA to that effect. So other than in that quite specific enforcement setting, yes. uh, Bank West's position is that customers should receive copies of valuations that they've paid for, yes. Thank you. I have no further questions, Just, Commissioner. Uh, uh, before you, uh, before I call on Mr. Sherry, uh, you spoke of uh, valuers and sales professionals having 10% of KPIs for asset growth. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. Do they also have a KPI for profitability? Uh, they do have a KPI for profitability. Can you explain to me what that? Uh, is measuring? Uh, the profitability, well, it's a revenue KPI, so it's the revenue generated on their portfolio through all of the products they sell, not just loan products.
So that uh, the incentive offered uh, is to uh, sell products to uh, clients that uh, are as profitable uh, as can be. No, so the, the way the KPIs are structured, there's a, a, an asset growth KPI and there's a revenue KPI, which make up no more than 40% of the overall KPIs. So 60% of the KPIs of the bankers don't relate to any financial measure. So the encouragement is to have a good, strong relationship with customers, understand the products that they need, and fulfill those needs for customers. That is the role of the banker. 40% of KPIs are financial. 40% are financial. However, the risk gate opener has to be met to be eligible for any payment, and the behavioural elements all have to be met as well. So if someone is consistently breaching from a risk perspective, they will not be eligible for an incentive. And if they do not display the correct behaviours and are not um, behaving in the way that we expect when dealing with customers, again, they will not receive an incentive. Yes. Thank you. Is there anything arising out of that, Ms. Orr? No, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Thank Sherry. You. So before I start, can I just mention a couple of matters to Ms. Orr? Yes, You may want to have some, ask some more questions about them. Excuse yes. me, sir. So the, the first matter is um, I need to correct the instructions I gave that I passed on about when we received the documents that I said we received yesterday at 4pm. In the case of two documents, and I'll give the numbers in a minute, we have now ascertained that we did receive them on the 29th of May. And that's we have found that out by comparing the... Um, ID numbers, and the two num the two documents concerned are CBA dot zero 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 two dot two one one five dot three nine three one, and CBA dot zero 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 two dot two one one five dot one eight one four, and again, Commissioner, we apologise for that. The other matter is a matter that Ms. Hall will take up with. Um, the witness. Which are the two documents? I know you've given the doc IDs, but yes, which are um, those two documents, sorry, Mr the, Sherry? I know that the one that ends in 3931 is Exhibit 4.107. And the second one, I don't have a note of the exhibit number, and I'm not 100% sure it was tendered. No. The that one wasn't tendered. The one that was tendered, Commissioner, was the briefing note with Jenny prior to meeting with Harrison Young. I see. Yeah, well, I'll, as I say, <laughs> I will consider what course is to be taken in relation to these matters. Of course, yes. Um, yes, go on. Uh, now, Mr Sherry drew to my attention this morning, Ms Taylor, that uh, when you were being shown the documents that were uh, provided overnight, you told him that there was a matter that you wished to correct oh, yes. from your evidence yesterday. Yes, so yesterday you showed me the FOS determination and asked me if it was included in my table on the three, and it is included. It is the second one down where the compensation um, by FOS was $3,000. Uh, could you just give me a moment to look at your reference to that determination? That was in paragraph 32 of your statement, CBA 9000000011. Now, it's 32 where you explained Yes. the circumstances of the three uh, FOS matters that had reached recommendation or determination wholly or partly in favour of the customer. Did yes. I understand you to say that the uh, determination I took you to yesterday is the determination referred to in 32A, 
which concerned a customer who disputed the structure of their lending and requested a refund of fees and charges. Yes, it is. So is there any reason, Ms Taylor, why you didn't describe that FOS determination as relating also um, to issues between um, uh, evaluation in 2010 and evaluation in 2013 that led to an LVR breach? At, this, at the time that I was actually pull, pulling the statement together, that issues arising from the banker had not come to full light and I have only in the last few weeks been able to start to put that together. So you didn't know at this time that the bank manager was involved in that determination? No, I, didn't. I understand that, but even without knowing that the bank manager was involved, it was apparent from the face of the determination that one of the primary issues that the applicants agitated in FOS was an LVR breach based on a difference between a 2013 and a 2010 valuation. Yes. Um, is there any reason you didn't mention that in your description of the FOS determination in paragraph 32A? At the time that I drafted, I, I wasn't looking at it in that way. I apologise. And do you think now that they're the same determination because of the reference to the $3,000 figure? Uh, but the, the, they are the only three that we've had, and I know that the, that we did do the research across all of the files, and so that is absolutely that one, yes. So do you accept that your description of that matter was incomplete in yes. paragraph 32 Yes, I do. Um, and would not have enabled us to identify? It certainly that. did not enable me to identify, yes. Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Yes. Yes, Mr Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms Taylor, you were asked some questions about the guarantee that the Ruddy's son gave. Yes. Did the bank enforce that guarantee at no, all? they did not. Thank you. Could, I, could the witness be shown Exhibit 4.94, please, Your um, Commissioner? And CBA treble zero one zero three nine three double zero eight two. And Ms. Taylor, you, you recognise this document from yes. yesterday? And it's the one about the business CEO awards? Yes, that's right. And you were asked some questions. It's a transcript for the record, uh, 3465. You asked some questions about whether these awards were given for anything other than sales or financial performance. Yes. If you look at the, um, even that, that first page, is that answer correct? If you, if no, you look at not. those, the first item, and you look at the third item, and if you go to the next page, if you look at the item, that's it should be page um, 0083, yes. If you look at the items down the bottom, see the one at the bottom, the very bottom? Yes. And if you look at the one above, or the one that's one, two, three, third from the bottom? Yes. And the one that's fourth from the bottom? Yes. And if we go to the next page, you'll see that the first one, talks about, sorry, that's the one, talks about customer service. Yes. And so does the second one. Yes. Second one talks about team, teamwork. Third one talks about customer services. So is it correct to say that the awards are given only for financial performance? No, it's not. They're given for service and teamwork as well. Thank you. Could I, could the witness be shown um, exhibit 38A, Commissioner, and it starts at CBA.4000.0096, I meant exhibit ST83A to her statement. Just 
just while we're going to that, um, Ms Taylor, I, I should have asked you before, the, the result of the mediation was that the bank wrote off some of the Ruddy's debt, wasn't it? Yes, the bank wrote off over $600,000. Thank you. Uh, have you got that exhibit in front yes, of you? Yes, I do. Could you go first to page dot one four four nine? This may need some help as to how to read this. This is the, the bank account statement yes. for the Ruddies. And if you look at page 1449, um, and there's an entry for 30 April. Yes. You see that? And the balance is that it's a debit balance of 264000 Yes. And then beneath that, against the date 28 March, there are a heading called debit interest rates. And then next line down, 01, agri-business limit, 200,000. Yes. Next line down, temporary business limit, $40,000. Yes. What do those limit figures mean? Uh, the 200,000 is the limit on the agri-business overdraft account. The 40,000 is a temporary excess that's been granted um, and applied to the account. And does that mean <coughs> various limits apply from 28 March? Is that the date? Yes, it is, yes. And does it mean they would have been applying or been applicable as at 30 April? Uh, they would have, yes. Yes, they would have. Does that mean that as at 30 April, they were, the Ruddies were more than $24,000? over both limits? Yes, they were. And could you go Sorry. Could you go to page one four five one? And you'll see at twenty May there's an entry about the limits again? Yes. Does that mean that by then the limit had, the $200,000 limit was the same, but the temporary business limit had been increased to 60000 Yes, it did, yes. By providing another 20000 um, temporary business limit. Yes, that's right. And if you look at, on that same page please, Ms Taylor, at 31 May, the balance was 247,000. Yes. And if you look up the page, there's, there's a figure of 253,000. Yes. At the 27th of May. And if you go to um, the following page, please. Um, sorry, I meant page 1453. You'll see that 31 May, the limits are 200,000 plus a temporary limit of 60,000. Yes. And the balance at the end of June, well, 26th of June, it's 253,000. Then there are several debits and there is A credit on the 28th. So that brings it back to 228,000, which is within the limit. If you go to one four five five, and you'll see at the bottom of the page, on um, fifteen July, we have the limits again, and this time there is the limit of two hundred and seventy thousand dollars, yes. about which you gave evidence yesterday. That's right. Yes, and you'll see that the balance of 31 July was $265,000. Yes. So it was within limit. If you look at the next page, which picks up from the August date, you'll see it starts with the 265. And there are, I think yesterday you said, there are checks being presented during this period. Yes, that's, that's what right. The debit column indicates. Yes, that's right. And there are a number of credits and we get to um, page 
1457, you'll see the balance is $271,000. Yes. The limit is still $270,000. Yes. And if you look at page 1458, it, it gets, it's still 271,000. Then it goes up to 277,000. Yes. And I think it's fair to say it doesn't reduce very much after that. That's Is that right. correct? Yes, that's correct. Is that what you meant when you said a couple of times, yesterday and today, that in your view the bank was supporting the Rudders to try and keep the business um, going to in response to the events that had happened that were affecting its cash flow? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Are there any questions arising out of that, sir? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. You may step down. You are excused. Mr. Sherry. Yes, Your Honour. Uh, your instructions about the time of receipt of the documents produced <coughs> last night changed during the course of this morning. Yes, Your Honour. If further investigation were to reveal that some additional change were necessary to reflect the position. I would expect the solicitors assisting the Commission to be informed of those matters and of that change in writing no later than close of business Tuesday 3 July. Just to be uh, sure that I understand the position as it presently stands, I understand you to tell me that two documents, namely CBA 0002 2115 and CBA 0002 2115 came into the possession of your instructing solicitors uh, on 29 May last, and that the other documents produced last night were received by them at 4 p.m. yesterday, 28 June. That, that's my instruction. They are my instructions, Your Honour. Yes. Very well. Yes, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, we turn now to a case study involving NAB. So if we could perhaps have a short break uh, to allow NAB's counsel to... 11.15, Thank sufficient. you, Commissioner.